Hey, Kev. Hey, Gabe. We need to make this a chat going. What was that? Yeah, I can't be on an audio. I'll have to be on a chat. Gary, I can hear you. Can you hear? Can you hear me? Sorry, Joe, you could probably hear my other conversation there briefly, couldn't you? Uh, okay. okay, so you can hear. Yep. Okay. <laughs> you said you couldn't hear, and so I was trying to figure out a way to make sure you could be part of the conversation. No, there was uh, somebody else on the other line, so to speak. <laughs> Too many <laughs> things going on. I'm supposed to be retired. <laughs> you guys hear me? Yeah, right? yeah, you're on two meetings at once. That's that's pretty awesome. All right. Well, it is. One minute after the, the half hour. So um, I guess let's get started. Um, shall we do a roll call? Sure. Michael Baranek. I'm here if you can hear me. Okay. Eric Bedell. Christopher Burroughs. I am here. DJ Brockway. Present. Martin Connor. Mike Fowler. Here, good morning. Patrick Hayes. Good morning, I'm here. Gary Hickenen. I'm here. Thank you. Scott Henderson. Chris Holiday. Luke Howard. Present. Dwayne Johnlin. Elizabeth Joyce. Bill Krause. John Lane. Mike McGivern. Present. Alan Montpelier. Henry Odom. Eric Olman, Andrew Poltorek, Irina Rasputnis, here, David Reddy, here, Lisa Rosenau. Poppy Storm. Gavin Tennold. Sean Big. Here. Amy Wheelis. Hey, I'm here. Just Amy. And is there anybody that joined us that any tag members that uh, didn't get called or didn't hear their name? Um, yes, Elizabeth Joyce.
Krista. Good morning, Phil. Good morning. I'm just listening in. And we do have a quorum. Hey. Thank you, Krista. All right. So welcome to the June 11th tag meeting. So um, I'm Joe Anderson, the chair. And we spent about 20 minutes last meeting going through kind of the rules and procedures that we're going to follow for the next many, many Fridays that we get to spend six hours together every Friday. Um, so I'm not going to re-go over those, uh, but I will highlight a few things. One is uh, in order to stay on track for the performance of the energy code that the legislature has required, we need to hit about a 19% reduction each code cycle between now and 2030. There's only a few code proposals that will get us substantially uh, in that direction. Um, and we're gonna go over one of those today. Um, please mute yourselves at all times unless you're um, talking. Uh, and please raise your hand when you have something to say. Um, the raise hand feature is under reactions. So if you click on reactions, you can raise hand. Um, I will call on you in the order in which I see your hand go up. When you're talking, please lower your hand so you don't stay at the top of my screen. The, I also highly encourage everybody to use thumbs up or if you really love something, heart it. Or if you don't like something, use the, the red X because normally we would look for head nods and general silent agreement or disagreement. If people are giving, giving scowls, uh, usually that means you know, they, they don't like what's being said. So I will rely a lot on the emotion, the reactions that you use to see whether we have general consensus on an idea or whether we need to robustly continue to debate that idea. So please use those. And if you don't have, if you don't know how to use those, please tell me and I'll, I'll help you figure that out. Um, no soliloquies. We don't need to know the entire history of the code. Um, please keep your comments relevant. We have 40 people in the room today, 41 people. So um, keep your comments short and relevant. And I think with that, uh, let's get started. Um, so the meeting minutes from last meeting were not posted until 4.30 yesterday. So Krista and I thought it would be a good idea to not vote on those uh, meeting minutes today, but to ensure that everybody has plenty of time to look at them. Um, so we'll, we'll, I'll suggest that that's um, not on the agenda today or not on the proposed agenda today and, and will happen at that next meeting, which is the 25th of June. And speaking of that, one more note, um, we haven't been officially told to review these proposals or referred these proposals by the Building Code Council. That will happen on the 18th, next Friday. So we can't officially vote anything into the, um, vote anything forward. But what we can do is come up with questions and uh, concerns and suggestions for the proponents for revisions. Or if everybody kind of generally agrees this is good, then we can kind of put them in a, in a batch of things and, and then vote on them quite quickly um, next time we get together when we've been officially um, given these proposals. Are there any questions about any of the stuff that I've said so far? Okay. Well then, um, I will entertain a motion to do something about the agenda. Um, and I'll suggest that um, we don't review and approve the minutes this week. Does anybody want to make a motion? It's your first, first chance to talk today. Uh, are you looking for a motion to approve the agenda? Yep, yeah, with, with uh, the oh, okay. exception of the reviewing and approving minutes. All right, I, motion, I move to approve the agenda uh, with the exception of item number three. Thank you. Do second. I hear a second? Second. second. Okay, all right. We have a motion, we have a second. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Okay, fine colors, it passes. That means we are on to item four, review and proposals. And we're gonna start with editorial and clarification proposals, which hopefully are not extremely controversial. Um, so please use your emoticons to, or your whatever they are, um, your smiley faces and what have you, to tell me if you agree with them generally. So we'll start with definition cleanup. Oh, and Lisa is not here right now, is she? She is, she proposed a lot of these. Um, so maybe, what's the first one she didn't propose? Uh, we have low energy buildings. That's one she didn't propose. I think the one you have pulled up right now, that was me and also low energy buildings is also me. Okay, why don't we go through those then? Okay, so um, so for this one, uh, that first one is just italicizing building thermal envelope to note that it is a definition. Um, for building thermal envelope, <clears throat> this is just to clarify I think the running understanding that we already have using um, definitions that either already exist or um, are proposed to exist. So really quickly, I would point out um, reading this language, I didn't write it as clearly as it should have been written. So really the key distinction is that it says, um, basically we're looking at any uh, building element like element assemblies um, that separate either a conditioned or a semi-heated space from one of the following, with one of the following being an enclosed plate, uh, a space that is not enclosed, an unconditioned space, or a low energy space. So that first, just, just that first part needs cleanup. It says from an area that is not an enclosed space, that not is in sort of a bad place because that could imply that is not in a closed space or is not an unconditioned space or low energy space. So I would reword that, but the intent of this is to say the building thermal envelope is really just wherever that dividing partition is, that dividing assembly between a conditioned or semi-heated space and one of these three, um, stated conditions. And then finally, unconditioned space, that's just, unconditioned space isn't defined in this code, but it is used in the code. Um, I'm not sure that it actually provides too much, like I'm not sure that the definition for unconditioned space is needed other than it is referenced in the code. Um, I think one big thing that comes up here is that second sentence. And just to note, this language was pulled directly from ASHRAE 90.1 2019. Is the second sentence in unconditioned space clarifies that crawl spaces, attics, and parking garages um, are not considered enclosed spaces. OK. Thank you. Um... Uh, Patrick. Um, the air barrier sentence, I, it restrict to prevent passage through air through the building thermal envelope. The building thermal envelope and the air barrier are not always the same. And an example of that is we may have an air barrier that goes through like in a five over two that follows the horizontal line through the floor and then and captures the elevator lobby in the parking garage. But the thermal envelope may go up the elevator shafts and we leave the elevator and stair shafts closed. Typically, it's the stair shafts. So they 
always the same. And this language is saying that they should be the same and that's not true. So I think the air barrier line should just, the building thermal envelope part should be scrapped because it's not true. And in practice, we go up, we leave the stair shafts closed, I mean cold, a lot. And the reason we leave them cold is to increase the glazing because it adds gross wall. And then there's certain buildings to where the stair shafts just automatically end up cold and are not, but the air barrier may not be go up those shafts. So you can have an air barrier that encompasses yep. the building that does not include the stair shafts. Okay, Patrick, thanks. That's, that's good. Um, did you want to comment on any other pieces of this? No, I think the other language, I, I don't really think it's needed because we've been getting along with it fine, but it does add to the definition. The only thing I have issue with is matching the air barrier to the thermal building thermal envelope. Okay. Uh, Mike Kennedy. Sorry, slow on the unmute. Um, I had two comments on the unconditioned space second sentence. Uh, I guess there's just something, and I know it, the first sentence deals with this. It's not a conditioned space. I, I do worry about the second sentence though, to kind of just saying parking garages with mechanical ventilation are not considered enclosed spaces. And sometimes there are parking garages inside of buildings that are actually heated parking facilities. Um, uh, you know, especially uh, companies with fleet vehicles sometimes use those. So I guess I had some concerns about how that last sentence might uh, get used. Um, and I guess I could ask the proponent what they think about that. And then the other one is in the thermal envelope change. It seems to not include the divide, demising wall between conditioned space and semi-heated space as part of a thermal envelope, but we require insulation in that demising wall. And I'm, I haven't gone and researched this, but I, I do wonder whether that's an issue, whether the thermal envelope also needs to include the space, a conditioned space connected to a semi-heated space, the wall between there. I can, I can answer that first part really quickly. Um, the reason to me that it's important to explicitly say that parking garages are not considered enclosed spaces are because the definition, right, low energy spaces were added as language to the Washington State Energy Code. And this has caused sort of confusion on if a parking garage is a low energy space. So even a fully unconditioned parking garage, if you read the definition of an unconditioned space, it technically would meet the definition of a low energy space. So this is sort of to clarify that a parking garage is not a low energy space. And in fact, per the building code, parking garages are sort of their own entire category where the building code defines an open parking garage. That's one of the definitions in the building code. And then the later section of the code is the definition for an enclosed parking garage, even though it's not really an enclosed space. But there may be enclosed parking garages. That could be a thing. But there are parking garages also that are not enclosed, right? Right. And I guess this summary judgment that parking garages will not be considered enclosed spaces when some of them are is my, my issue. I, I think that could use a little clarification. And Mike, the clarification you're hoping for is if they are heated or I guess cooled possibly, um, if, they're if they're conditioned in addition to being ventilated or is it more that the, the term enclosed is not accurate to all spaces under this type. Yeah, yeah, I guess, I mean, if it's unconditioned, cross, unconditioned crawl spaces, attics and parking garages are not considered enclosed spaces. I, I, I don't know, I don't know, I'd have to go research this one. 
I, this actually feels complicated to me. I, this is Patrick, parking garages are not conditioned space. They are ventilated. They have screened doors that are just grills. I think you're chasing rainbows here, Aaron. Parking garages aren't even semi-heated spaces. Right, they're in the, this is in the definition of unconditioned space, pulled directly from ASHRAE 90.1. I agree with what you're saying. This is to be clear. Yeah. But I can show you buildings with indoor parking garages where they're actually actually often heated spaces too. Um, well, you, better, you better bring the set of drawings and post it up here because Mike, I've never seen one and the code requires them to be heavily ventilated due to exhaust fumes. That, right. one rare, that would be one rare piece. Well, I think there's a few police stations and a few uh, fleet vehicle facilities. Or it, it would be a rare piece. How about this? The, the reason that I put this here is because this definition was pulled straight from 90.1, which I think gives it a good backing. There is already a definition for enclosed space in this energy code. So it could be that either we take a look at the definition for enclosed space, or there's just an agreement that a parking garage isn't an enclosed space, which is where it sounds like everyone sort of is landing anyway. If a parking garage was to be an enclosed space, which Mike's talking about, it would be considered semi-heated or conditioned space, and you'd have to treat it that way, and the whole ventilation HVAC system would have to accommodate it that way. It, it could be a low energy space if it was enclosed. It could be a low energy space, absolutely, which is a tough definition to meet because it's very minuscule. Okay, well, it sounds like this needs work, but with all this in mind, the next, this is just sort of to bring up low energy space next. Thanks for pulling that up. So this would be, I mean, if there's an agreement that a parking garage, a parking garage that is not enclosed because there are parking garages that are closed and there are parking garages that are not enclosed that if there's a parking garage that has like a roll down graded door or just a fully open ramp, that wouldn't be an enclosed space, correct? That's the most common one. Yeah, well, often the, often the grill fun. is the air intake for the garage. So. Correct, Shell. And then we have an exhaust fan elsewhere and, or two. I guess just, just to move this along, Aaron, do you feel like you have uh, sufficient feedback to make revisions of this, or do you think we need to provide more feedback? I think I have enough feedback for this. I probably just pull out the second sentence in unconditioned space. Um, and going back to the original comment on the air barrier, I didn't change the, the language at all for air barrier. So that was not the intent on this. I literally just italicized building thermal envelope. Yeah, that thermal envelope part needs to go away. That's it's not that's not how we build the buildings day in, day out. I mean, they are not, they don't have to be the same. And it would create it's not saving energy. I mean, the air bear that's understood on my part. That is just outside of the scope of this yeah, exact I mean, proposal. What what Aaron did was underline three words that are already part of the code. So, um, or italicize them rather, um, because they are impact defined. Um, and I don't say that this, I, I mean, my strict reading of, of what's on the screen right now does not say that they need to be coplanar, that the air barrier and the building thermal envelope need to be coplanar, just that the, the idea of an air barrier is that it prevents air leakage through the thermal envelope, which in fact, I think is just, a true statement. Um, Mike? Yeah, I just wanted to reemphasize, uh, please research whether um, whether the wall between conditioned space and semi-heated space should be considered building envelope. I think that's already in the code, Mike. 
Well, but it's not in this change to the definition the way it's being worded. It's not saying that the wall between condition space and semi-heated is part of the envelope. Well, it should be. So anyway, research that. Okay, David? Um, <clears throat> I just looked at 90.1 and their uh, definition of continuous air barrier, they say, uh, does not include the word thermal, kind of to uh, Patrick Hayes's uh, point. And I, I agree with that. And I don't know if that's something Aaron, you would be interested in including by striking out the thermal part in your proposal. It's a good idea, David. Um, I, I, I think that might be saying. for a different proposal because I'm not quite as familiar with all of this. So I think that sounds like a separate uh, change okay. because that is a change to the language. This proposal is not. Gotcha. The tag in its infinite wisdom could make that change um, anytime we felt like it. Mm -hmm. um, what if we vote this one forward, we could make that change um, if we wanted. So keep that in your back pocket, David, and we'll, we'll see if we want to make that change later. Cool. Patrick, your hand is up. I'm taking it down. Okay. All right. Aaron has sufficient uh, feedback on this one. So um, I'm going to mark this as, as going to be revised and we'll bring it back. So Aaron, do you want to go on to your next one? Yes, this is really straightforward. I just added the word enclosed to low energy buildings where enclosed spaces is already defined in the code. Um, the word enclosed didn't previously exist. So low energy buildings, this could have, I just, I, I feel like this is needed because it is really supposed to be an enclosed portion of the building. Any feedback, any uh, user reactions? Tell me if you, think this is good, bad, ugly. Patrick. I'm not sure that it's needed. I have been doing a couple of low energy buildings here recently, and I think the language is just fine. I, you know, one is a big cabinet shop that they don't want to heat. And I mean, low energy buildings, it is tricky to apply it. They're very unique, and that could also include storage facilities. And we're building a lot of storage facilities, and I'm not sure why people want to store all this stuff. But anyways, we're building a lot of them. I just don't know that it's needed. It, does it hurt anything, Patrick, to include it? Well, in a type U building, it could. Because a type U building could still qualify as low energy, but may have big operating doors. Who knows? I mean, it could still have some heat going on. This is very, very low amount of heat, by the way, one watt per square foot. But a type U building may not have four walls. And it could still be low energy building. So this would be on the flip side would be by not including this language, parking garages are considered low energy buildings. To me, right, that's which is unheated space, Aaron. Sorry? A parking garage to me in my world, and I do an awful lot of building permits is not conditioned space, not- I fully agree with that. Number two below says those that do not contain conditioned spaces. So they would meet the definition of a low energy building. So why are you proposing that it has to be enclosed? To exclude parking garages specifically from being considered low energy buildings. Lisa. Hi, yeah, thank you. Um, apologize, I was a little bit late. Um, well, I'll, I'll kind of give a, a counter comment to uh, some of the discussion here. Uh, so we do hear from jurisdictions who are trying to navigate difference between a low energy space and uh, where you're heating outside of a building, you know, and 
So we do get questions about, you know, what, what qualifies as that. And so what we've always said is, is based on what it says in the building code is that it needs to be a space that, that's enclosed. So, you know, so it's four walls, um, a fully enclosed space is, is considered a, a building. Um, and then if it doesn't have four or, you know, basically a six sided box, then it is considered exterior, uh, open to the ambient outdoors, which would, which would apply to uh, Aaron's point about a parking garage that is, is, is open, that doesn't have a closing garage door or something like that. So I don't think that adding the word enclosed really hurts anything. And it, it adds some clarity um, to something that we do actually get a surprising number of questions about. I, I fully disagree and I'll give you a good example. Um, in Snohomish County, there is a pallet manufacturing company and it has no and they have machines and saws and everything. It's on Three Lakes Road and they work year round. And those people are building pallets and shipping them, but they've got to have some sort of heat going on. And now they could use infrared gas, but if you add this word enclosed, then you exclude them from, from having even one watt per square foot, say at a workstation, because it's not an enclosed building, it's a type U building. Well, actually what it does is it, it pushes, if they do want to install heating, actually now, now that we're talking this through, I, I'm seeing, actually seeing the benefit of this, because what this would do is it would point them in the direction where they have to comply with the you know, uh, uh, heating uh, outside of a building. And that requirement, is, it has to be, um, you know, some type of radiant heating system, and it has to have uh, some type of occupancy sensor or timer switch or something like that. So it being in a not an enclosed building, it pushes them over to that provision. So the heat and actually that provision doesn't even give a limit on what the capacity needs to be like this one does. But um, it, that that's what jurisdictions have, at least the ones we've talked to, that's what they point to is that if the building is not enclosed, uh, it's open to the outdoors all the time, then they want to see a heating system that's required to have controls that will shut that heating system off when there's you know nobody in the space. And so um, I'd be interested to hear if is the representative from the jurisdiction community it, are, is, um, I'm sorry, I forget who that is. Are they um, on the call today? Mike McGivern, you. Hi, Mike. Sorry, <laughs> no, <laughs> couldn't remember if it was you or somebody else. So, what is your thought about how, how do jurisdictions interpret this? Uh, the difference between a, you know whether a space is enclosed or not. I can't answer that directly. Um, I'm not a plan reviewer, so um, I tend to agree with the adding the definition to enclosed. Uh, to include enclosed um, to match what the building code says. Mike Kennedy. Yeah, um, I, I guess I thought this was a pretty good addition, but I, I guess I, I was going to suggest maybe there should be a small subgroup to go through all these definitions, thinking of Lisa and Aaron and Pat trick. Um, to make sure they get worked out because it seems like there's quite a bit of small nuance here that's kind of hard to hash out in this setting. That sounds like a great idea. Um, Aaron, does that sound like a good idea? Yeah, there's a lot of um, language interplay with language that Lisa has added to the code previously, so I do think that would make sense. Okay, and um, Mike Kennedy's suggestion was that you Patrick himself and Lisa are that group. Was that what you suggested, Mike? I wasn't including myself in that. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> Patrick, Aaron, and Lisa, does that seem like a good, okay, Lisa gives me the thumbs up. Does that sound good, Patrick? Yes. And are there other proposals, Aaron, that you are thinking that would fall into this? Um, 224 uh, was the previous one. This is 225. Are there other proposals? 
Um, not that I can think of off the top of my head. I mean, the definition, yes, the definition of how to classify what spaces need to meet the requirements of C406, this language will also feed into that, right? There's been a bit of ambiguity around what C406 requirements are for different space conditioning types. So that would be related to this too. Ab okay. Absolutely, Aaron. This is where this plays in heavy is C406. Okay, so that sounds great. And then as we go through the definitions and the other things that uh, um, would fall to this group uh, later, why don't we just maybe assign a couple of those to the Patrick, Lisa, Aaron group. Okay, awesome. Um, why don't we go back to the first one, 148, uh, which is a Lisa um, one. And uh, Lisa, do you wanna talk to that? That's uh, proposal 148. Yeah, actually, so all of these definition updates, um, they all are coming from the Seattle Energy Code. So these are clarifications that the folks over at Seattle uh, decided to add. Um, and so, you know, I, I can talk through each one individually. Uh, I would also invite Dwayne Jolin, if he's on the call, uh, to provide his feedback on this. Uh, I, I'm, I'm assuming that he was a part of the development of these different definitions, but that, that's the basis of where they, they came from. So uh, would you like- on vacation right now. I, yeah, I'm, I, I'm on. I'm on vacation, so I can't talk. But I'm really happy to have Lisa lead us through these. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, how about this? I'll, I'll do my best, Wayne, and then maybe you can chime in and, and, let, and let me know if I'm missing the point on any of these. Um, okay. So, do you want me to go through each one? Well, I guess is this something that? Why don't you go through it really quickly, and we'll okay. see if we want this the Patrick Lisa Aaron group to address sure. these outside of this if there's if there's any controversy sure yeah and the other part of this too is is that uh you know we're trying not to make this be a, a change um these are considered clarifications um or yeah they're all basically clarifications we, we're trying not trying to increase stringency in the code um but i'd welcome feedback on that so i'll just go through all of them really quick um so uh under attic and other um, this was just, uh, instead of saying all other roofs, which is kind of what's been in the code for a while, uh, and then you've got this, you know, tagged at the end, you know, but excluding roofs with insulation entirely above deck and middle, middle building roofs. This is just basically saying the exact same thing. We're just flipping it around so that it is just worded better. And so there really is no change uh, to the attic and other roof definition other than just you know, an improvement in the way the sentence is structured so it's a little uh, clearer. So okay. there's that. Uh, Patrick, do you want, did you have something to say about this? Okay, go on, go on Lisa. Great, uh, so automatic control device. Uh, I, this is, uh, uh, again, very, very basic definition. Uh, there isn't a definition for an automatic control device in the code. So this is a, a nice addition and just basically stating the device capable of automatically turning loads um, off and on with ma manual intervention. So very, very basic. Um, okay, Mike question. Kennedy, did you ever comment on this one? Well, I guess it was the off or on. There's a lot of controls that do things like reset temperature. Um, dim uh, uh, it seems like that's the definition is if anything too specific. Maybe it's control loads as opposed to on and off. Yeah. Adjusting loads or something. Yeah, even the word loads might be. But anyway, I think that everything except the loads off and on is works. Okay. I'd... Wayne, do you have any comment on this one on how the Seattle came to this definition? Um, yeah, one, one of the engineers, you know, that was participating, I forget which one, um, wanted this in there to clarify, but I think that's a good friendly amendment is instead of turning uh, loads off and on, um, it, it, it would be 
controlling equipment without manual intervention? Controlling devices? Yeah, controlling equipment and devices. Perfect. Okay. Sounds good. David Reddy, did you have a something well, to say? I just wanted to point out there is already a definition for automatic in the code. So is this kind of complementary to that? Go take a peek. I'd grab that really quick. That's pretty good. Oh, that In fact, it's complimentary. <laughs> yeah. I like that it's impersonal influence. Yeah, that's, that's really, that could be a judgment on somebody, I guess. I don't think it's needed. The definition of automatic control device? Yes. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm... I don't think it's needed. For any of these from the Seattle code, we're not falling on our swords um, for them and bring them up because yeah, these all were the subject of discussion at Seattle and many of them have been in there for years and I'm trying to bring the two codes into closer alignment. But if people think automatic control device, maybe this is a good point for a show of hands, Chell. Yeah, so how many people, based on the discussion and your thoughts, think we should define automatic control device? Let's see. I see eight or so people for and one person against. So it's would appear that, that this would pass with flying colors if we were voting on it today. So I guess let's let's move on um, with the idea of oh, a couple against David Reddy's now adding his voice to, to that. Um, okay, well, I think the definition is as good as it could be and we can vote later on whether it, we vote this into the code or not. Um, okay. okay, Lisa, go with building entrance. Okay, so building entrance. Um, you know, this is actually, I thought this was a really good addition here. Um, so uh, there's two details in this one. Uh, it does it, uh, add uh, it in parentheses that this does include um, elevator doors, uh, such as those in, in a parking garage area. You know, So you definitely have those types of entrances into the building uh, in parking garages where it, that, that's it it's just the elevator door so I, I think that was a good addition there to uh, to find uh, what a little is a, a little bit better and then the other part where it talks about uh, buildings that have a separate uh, one-way doors uh, for entering and leaving you know like in a movie theater or something like that uh, this is actually something and I'm trying to remember where this was clarified before in the code, but it's not in there now, um, where it explained that uh, you know an exit only door is is still considered uh, a building entrance. But uh, I, I thought this was a very nice, uh, very helpful addition to get that detail uh, into the actual definition. Uh, versus, I think it was I think it was in the vestibule part of the code before. I think this came up in regards to a Costco. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. Okay, but uh, I, I thought this was a, a really nice um, improvement to this definition. Okay, um, any comments on this? You wanna show your reactions and show whether you think this is, these are good improvements? <clears throat> okay, I'm seeing yeah. only positives. So let's, let's move on then. I, I have my hand up. Okay, go ahead, Patrick. My concern is where buildings have separate one-way doors to enter like emergency exits, 
if this language turns it into a building entrance, how does it interact with the vestibule portion? Are we going to have to have a vestibule at emergency exits? Well, it, it looks like it says any doors ordinarily used to leave the building. Um, and I, I would guess an emergency only exit would not ordinarily be used to leave the building. So I find that perhaps clearer. Luke? I got a, just a small comment um, separate from Patrick's. The new sentence where buildings have separate one way doors to enter and leave. Should that be enter or leave since it's a one way door? I was wondering that too, if it would be better. Good catch. Yeah, and actually, uh, I, I just, I'm looking at one detail, um, probably should have included in the proposal. Um, and that it, it, and Kristen, when you're done with that edit, uh, if you could call up C402.5.9 vestibule, uh, there is some language in there where I think if, if we put this in the definition, then the language in that, I'm not sure if it should remain there because it, uh, it overlaps. And I apologize, I did not catch this earlier. Well, Chris is looking that up, Luke. It's a you... five nine, uh, C402 uh, five nine. There we go. And it's if you look at the paragraph there, it, it, the, the uh, charging statement, um, it's the last sentence in the charging statement where it says, uh, for purposes of this section, building entrances shall include exit only doors and buildings where separate doors for entering and exiting are provided. So basically that definition now is essentially saying that, um, uh, but now it's, it's added as definition and not just language inside the vestibule provision, which I think is a, a good, change but the, actually this in what to what patrick said exit only doors would presumably include egress only doors right yeah this is this is egress only doors and they're one and i like the the def, the terminology in the seattle's definition where it says you know doors that are you know ordinarily used for exiting. So to Patrick's point, these are not, you know, emergency exit doors. These are, you know, again, like in a movie theater or something, this is where, you know, people, this is how they exit the building routinely. Yeah. So it actually makes it a little less stringent sense, or, or rather it clarifies that exit only doors are not, I mean, that egress doors are not, not required to have a vestibule. Whereas reading the definition as it is now, um, unless there's an exception. Uh, yeah, it says doors not intended to be used as a building entrance. <laughs> so, you know, you can just kind of see how the language is, it, it just, yeah. it's muddied, right? It, it really is. And so um, I think that, that what Seattle did is, is, a, is a, a clearer yep. way of doing this. Yep, I, I, I see that too. I think it's, I think it's good. Um, we also then, then probably italicize building entrances right here because it's a definition. Yeah, it, it should be italicized. I guess my only question to the group, which again, is not, I did not include this in my proposal, but I would accept it as a friendly amendment, um, would be, do we strike that last sentence in the vestibule section? Because now it's basically, we've got two, it, we're saying the same thing in two places. Okay, show of, show of uh, virtual hands. Um, do you like striking this sentence? The last, yeah, the last sentence there. You know, I, hmm. Dwayne, did Seattle do that? I didn't check that detail. No, um, and I, I think it's, I think it's probably useful to leave that sentence where it is because people looking at vestibules are like thinking about a different issue. I, I, I personally just leave it alone, but 
It's just me. It would be okay. It would be okay. I with agree. Me. We spend far more time in the vestibule area than we do in definitions. Okay. As long as we are comfortable that what, what's saying it's saying the exact same thing. I guess that's that's what's key. Because that that's when things get confusing is when it doesn't say the exact same thing. Yeah. Uh, Mike McGivern. Yeah, just for reference, the building code does not reference entrances. It it states them as public entrances, which inc include or exclude service entrances. So I don't know if we need to address service entrances in this or not, but uh, this is for future reference. Well, we didn't like the word public entrances because you know, if you're going into a Microsoft facility and only employees ever come in, the public never comes in, then it'd be like you'd never have to have vestibule. So I think, you know, our wordier thing that just says entrances, you know, uh, that are ordinarily used um, by occupants or something is, handles that. So I, I like the direction of not striking the last sentence in here um, in vestibules, but leaving it as is. Does that seem like a general path forward? Everybody, please show your hands. Please emote. Emote. Yeah, act, release your inner teenager and these smiley faces. Okay, I'm seeing positive reactions. So let's... Let's move on to, okay, go ahead, Lisa. Okay, yeah, sorry, just making sure that we kind of, you know, check all those details. Um, okay, so for computer room, um, this is, uh, instead of having the uh, translation or the, the uh, adjustment from, um, you know, square foot to meters, just in, instead of doing this kind of a random, <laughs> 0 0.092 meters squared, which is like, okay, what does that mean? Um, they switched it to 215 watts per meter squared, which I think is uh, much better. Um, and then uh, it has a pointer to data center. So again, this is just making it a little easier, a little clearer. That makes sense. Does anybody think this is a bad idea? Okay, let's move on. Condition space. Yeah, condition space. Um, again, another really, I think this is a good addition. Um, it does indicate that condition spaces do include elevator shafts, stair enclosures, enclosed corridors connecting condition spaces and enclosed spaces um, through which conditioned air is transferred and they actually, you know, give a air change limit on, you know, what would would be the definition for that. Uh, I thought that was a, a good addition uh, because that is an area <clears throat> in the building where we do get questions uh, from folks about whether they need to as a part of their condition space uh, calculations or not. Uh, Patrick. Well, this has been in the Seattle Energy Code since 2012. The problem with it is, and it is a problem almost on every single project, elevator shafts, yes, because they are a piston. There's no way to measure a rate of exceeding three air exchanges per hour in a stair shaft. Stair shafts, need to be excluded. And this is the conclusion at many meetings with plan reviewers at the city of Seattle. You can enforce elevator shafts. They operate like an engine. And yes, there was most likely three air exchanges per hour. But there is no way to measure stair enclosures because nobody knows how the occupants of the building are using the stairs, whether they're using them or not, and nobody's that clairvoyant. If you are that clairvoyant, I suggest you get in the stock market. 
So this language is okay, and it forces what it does is it forces the building envelope into the parking garage and into the elevator lobby of the parking garage, which you have to insulate. And that's fine, and that's good added language, but the stair enclosures need to be removed. And then the language would be far better than what's in the Seattle Energy Code. Lisa, do you want to respond? Or, or Dwayne, if you're still on? Um, I, I don't have a, uh, an opinion, a strong opinion, one direction or the other on that detail. Um, so I'm going to defer to Dwayne. What, uh, do you have an opinion about that? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I've never heard of any of these decisions to which Patrick refers in his uh, um, This was just trying to draw a line so that people- uh, Patrick and Lisa, can you mute for a second? And Michael Baranek as well. Um, just, just uh, uh, this is helping uh, us to draw a line between what is and isn't um, a, a condition space, and uh, so so you, you can draw the line wherever you like. But but um, this was this has been for a few code cycles. Um, I, as far as I can tell, a, a good way to keep things cleaner and help people understand what their requirement are. So the, the stair enclosure thing needs to be removed because you you made that point, Patrick. Why? Because there's no way that you can say that any building official, anybody can say that a stair enclosure is exceeding three air exchanges per hour. It's just not, it's not reality. Yeah, their stair enclosure is definitely. An okay. elevator shaft, absolutely yes. The stair enclosure, no. It needs to be, it's bad language, Shell. Okay. And, Thanks, Patrick. And bad language in the Seattle Energy Code for years. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, Robbie. State code. Yeah, I hope you guys can hear me. All right, I haven't tested this mic. Yep. Um, I'm just curious, the, the transferred part, you know, as, a, as an engineer, I would read that as intentional transfer. Um, it sounds like Patrick's thinking that it's, it's infiltration. But if it's meant to be infiltration, I would think it should say that. Uh, transfer error, I think, as an industry term is mostly used as like replacement air. Um, I just searched through the code and couldn't find a, a real definition of transfer air, but replacement air is in there and it makes mention of transfer air as a source of that. Yes, Robbie, that's the intention here. Is for intentional or for infiltration? Sorry, for intentional. Okay, so I think that, doesn't that address Part of Patrick's concern that you know we don't have to calculate like what the crack length is and and uh, you know what a stack effect is going to draw through the stair. It's it's more about if you were trying to intentionally use that that shaft as a makeup air source. Agreed, Robbie. You know the, the... okay, Patrick. Um, are you going to suggest some code language? Just remove stair enclosures. And okay, you, you suggested that we're gonna, we're trying to get through this quickly. So um, let's I, let other people speak, okay? My, my suggestion would be if, uh, it sounds like Dwayne just wants it to be intentional transfer or maybe you could make, mention excluding infiltration or not including infiltration. That's if we strange. put the word intentional in front of transfer, Intentionally transferring as if you say intentional, then it's part of the mechanical system in 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 front of exceeding three air exchanges per hour. And then if we don't do that in the stair enclosure, it would be exempt. I, I think so. That's so I thought that addressed your concern. And I, I'm also just not aware of any use of stair enclosures or elevator shafts for intentional transfer air. That's why I was a little confused whether it's meant to include infiltration. But they do need they do need, do need a, a modest amount of ventilation air, right? No, I mean a lot of stairs are not ventilated. They're not ventilated. 
the corridors are pressurized. David Reddy. Um, I agree that trying to um, put a air change uh, threshold on what is considered, uh, and I don't think the intent, my understanding of this was not intended to be intentional transfer air. This was, I think of this more as, you know, that you can have air movement between say the bottom of the stairwell where there is usually a heater and the top uh, sections of the stairwell. Um, that, that was my understanding of this clarification. So I think it could be, it should be revised, but I, I, my understanding of the intent of this is that the entire stairwell, if the top is part of the condition boundary, that the bot that applies then to the entire stairwell, unless there is a um, some sort of barrier or uh, building thermal envelope component that separates the bottom and the top of the stairwell. If we put the word intentional in front of transfer, does that solve all our problems? I shouldn't say that changes it for sure, but uh, is that the intent? Uh, Dwayne, was your intention that the entire stairwell, if the top of the stairwell is part of the condition envelope, that the bottom could be excluded from the thermal envelope? Well, a lot of times, David. Patrick. Um, the stairs are cold, more often than not. Um, Go ahead, Dwayne. I think that word works. Uh, I think I'm happy with the addition of the word intentionally. And, and once again, the, this is always the danger of this architect here commenting on mechanical engineering principles. But I think I think we're good there. Okay, let's let's just do a show of emotions. <laughs> How are we feeling? Is this good? David doesn't like it. Other people do like it. David, is there an easy way to solve this or is this something that needs to happen outside of this tag? Well, I, I guess I'm, I would be interested to hear it's because that's what this means, but this change that means that the top, say 10 stories of a stairwell will be part of the, could be included in the condition envelope and the bottom two stories that go through a parking garage would be excluded and they would not need insulation. Unless I guess there, if, if there's a heater at the bottom of the stairwell, as there often is, then that makes it a heated space. What, what happens in between? In my opinion, it should just be the entire stairwell that is part of the condition envelope or consider condition space if it is any part of it is within the envelope. I don't, I don't understand how you're reading that. So this three air changes per hour. So what your intent was that some there was a transfer fan in stairwells that would be designed to transfer this and therefore it would be considered I, i've never even seen an application where that would even apply yeah and what i'm now what i'm looking at is reading this language the elevator shaft stair enclosures corridors connecting condition spaces and enclosed spaces through which conditioned air is intentional is transferred at, at this rate it and does the through which this is transferred at a rate apply to all of those phrases or just that last phrase and enclosed spaces through which conditioned air is transferred? I, I'm going to suggest that our little uh, our, our smart group of definition writers uh, get get together and hammer this out. Um, are there any? Is there any other? Does that sound? Is that acceptable to Lisa, Patrick, and Aaron? Sure. I mean, okay. it, sounds good. Is there any more input that that group needs from this group? Probably. Okay. Well, let's move on then. Sorry, I was muted. Um, so the next one is uh, a, a, a small change to the controlled plant growth environment definition. Uh, again, I, I thought that was a good change that it, it, it makes it clear that a plant growth environment are uh, those group F and U buildings or spaces that are used exclusively for um, plant growth. And so I think that that tightens this up, 
this definition up um, pretty well. Okay, seeing no hands up, let's move on. Okay. And uh, for data center, this is just uh, made this identical change to um, the definition above uh, where we're just the, swapping the 20 watts per 0.92 meters squared to 215 watts per uh, you know, one meter squared. So again, just a little bit of clarity there. It's good to me. Okay. Uh, and then this one change in luminar level lighting control, uh, this uh, make this is also a very good change because it aligns the language in the definition language in section C405 about luminar level lighting controls. And that is that uh, each luminaire shall have either a, a local or central wireless networking capability. So this is just aligning the two um, details in the code so they say the same thing. Awesome. If CJ likes it, I like it. All right, solar zone. Okay, uh, so this is adding a definition mm -hmm. for what a solar zone is, which is great because uh, there wasn't a definition for this when that chapter was added to the code. And so it basically just clarifies that it's a clear area or an area reserved solely uh, for current and future installations of photovoltaic or solar hot water systems. So a nice, nice definition that will align with that new chapter. Is this pulled from anywhere, did you say, Lisa? Uh, that question you'd have to pose to Dwayne John Lund. Uh, yeah, it's pulled from the depths of my soul. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Does anybody have any comments on this? Mike is celebrating the depths of Dwayne's soul. Okay. Well, we might get we might come back to this definition when we talk about uh, solar energy later. But for now, I don't see any comments on it. So let's move right. to space conditioning category okay. or control. Do we talk about controlled receptacle? Uh, oh, no, we skipped that one. Okay. Thank you, Krista. Yeah, so controlled receptacle. Um, again, it's uh, nice to have a definition for this. Uh, did check on the internet, and it does align uh, with the definitions that you'll find in other sources. Um, uh, technical journals and that kind of thing on what a controlled receptacle is. So again, a, a, a nice addition to the code. Either everybody's asleep or, or nobody has any comments on this. So let's, let's move on. Great. And then the last one, uh, space conditioning category. This is just, um, this is a, just a clarification. Uh, the language that was in there before, and I think I'm guilty of this one. Um, we had the words, you know, from lowest to highest, <laughs> where we have low energy, semi-heated condition, or whatever. Um, that's not really needed. So Seattle struck those those words. I, I agree. Makes sense. Okay. Any thoughts on this? We've referred a few things back to be revised, um, and then we have a an ACE group that's going to revise a couple of them. Okay. Well, let's move on to, I think mass transfer deck is the next one. Yes, uh, this one here is, uh, I'm really happy to see this one uh, because this, this detail in the code has been um, misunderstood for sure uh, for a while. So I'll, I'll start out with saying what this was, uh, what we believe the intent was and uh, I'll ask Dwayne to chime in on this if I don't get this right. Um, that the intent was that the code is not saying that there needs to be a thermal break there. This is a structural element. And so that really cannot, it can't be broken. And, and we've heard that from structural engineers that are like, they hear back from jurisdictions to say, hey, code says there's supposed to be a thermal break here. And they're like, no, 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 that's not what this is supposed to do. This is a structural element 
can't break that. The only reason why this was in the code and it was in uh, table C402.1.4 providing a U factor for that is that if there is a mass transfer deck in a project, then the designer to do a UA calculation and take the penalty for that mass transfer deck uh, with, with a penalty of a, of a, a 0.2. So this was really just uh, the intention was to make sure that the uh, thermal heat loss of this element is accounted for in the overall calculation, uh, but it is not intended to require that there be a thermal break there. And so by including it in the table above, C2.3, and giving it an R value, that doesn't make any sense. We're not saying it needs to be broken with this piece of R5. Uh, and so I think what Seattle did here uh, was great, uh, that they, they made this very, very clear what the intent was. And then I also have just a tiny little improvement here in that table C, if you go scroll back up, Krista, or tell, in C402.1.3, um, uh, there's just some R's missing. Uh, so it, it, it was saying, you know, R13, you know, plus 14 CI, um, and some folks have been confused by what that meant. So um, I think just to add clarification, um, I'm recommending we put the R in front of the continuous insulation um, details. Okay. Um, great. Uh, Patrick. Patrick, you're on mute. That's actually not the true history of this. This was my proposal back in 2012, and it was intended to accommodate a mass transfer deck and get it removed from the mass wall. It was intended to create relief for buildings that had a lot of exposed concrete at the transfer deck and all buildings that aren't woody walk-ups have a mass transfer deck at one level. And the best definition is probably the transition from a type one structure to a type five structure or type one to type three, type two, three A, any of those where we're building a different, it has nothing to do with this drawing here. It has to do with, and mass transfer decks can be anywhere from 12 inches to, I've seen them as thick as 18 inches thick. The R5, which should not be, a, say, not required, would also allow you to permit one of these buildings prescriptively, which when we originally put this in, if you have a mass transfer deck, you need to at minimum do UA calculations. So putting the not required into, you're actually losing energy because the building will no longer be calculated. Um, the definition, and I think Dwayne will you know, chime in on it, has always been not perfect. Uh, the last one that's in the code, I think Dwayne did, and it has a little bit of controversy to it as to, is there- Patrick, can you keep your comments to the specific text in front of us and, and, and changes to that or suggestions to improve it? Let me read it real quick. Okay. Um, no, no, you know, I, I actually wouldn't change it because it doesn't, it doesn't need this added language if you're talking about the wall laterally offset column below. That has nothing to do with what the mass transfer deck is and or semi-heated space on it. It's not needed. Um, okay. I, I have one quick comment or uh, additional uh, comment about this. So if, again, if you could scroll up, so we look at C402.1.3. Um, I would accept as a friendly amendment to uh, just strike mass transfer decks lab edge out of there altogether. Uh, that was actually what the way it was in the code um, back in 2012, I think. There, there wasn't an, an R value 
in there. Um, this was added, I think, in 2015. And Dwayne, you can correct me on that. Um, and I, I would ask a question to Patrick. Um, the code is not requiring that there be a thermal break incorporated here. I think any structural engineer uh, would would strongly challenge that, um, which is actually what we've been hearing. Is structural there was never anything about a thermal break. It was David Balin and I came up with this, that you need to average R5. And that is the balance between what is insulated slab edge and what is uninsulated slab edge. There is nothing to do with the thermal break, Lisa. Well, so that's what's confusing though, because if it says that the mass transfer deck slab edge has to have an insulation value of R5, that's not an averaging number. It sure says- it is. Sure it is. I mean, I do it all the time. You, I mean, every single working day of my life, I average the mass transfer deck, the balance between insulated and not insulated slab edge. And I mean, I could put it up on the screen. It's in every one of my building permit intakes. Okay, let's hear from uh, Dwayne. Dwayne, you're on mute. Okay, so as that last point, um, if, when you're averaging um, across, uh, when you're doing anything that's not just following the prescriptive path and you use the, the U value um, method, our, our value doesn't, uh, our value is just, just for prescriptive. Now, um, if you could scroll back up uh, to the diagram and the definition, um, yes, a mass transfer deck is where you're move, you're transferring that structural load from the column uh, or wall line above to uh, another one that's offset from there. And yes, Patrick's right. We use them on all kinds of buildings, um, whether or not we're we're changing um, our our uh, construction type. Uh, oh, and there is one little edit in here that I did wrong on Seattle Code, and that's that it uh, where I in the diagram where I put in mass transfer slab, it should say mass transfer deck slab. So it matches the thing above. But I just um, thought that the way it was currently defined is really hard to read and follow. And, and for some reason, people wanted to define that edge, but I just wanted to define what is a mass transfer deck slab and in a, in a more clear way, and then obviously there can't be an R value because um, it's just gotta be solid concrete all the way through. But when you're doing a U value um, <clears throat> trade-off, then, then we put in a, a, a lenient uh, U value there so that to make it, um, to just recognize that, that that's a difficult situation and we're always gonna have some heat loss through it. So I think that this, massively clarified what this rule is about, what the mass transfer deck is, and, and how to apply the rules. I'm also, I'm fine with taking that whole line out in the R value table about this because it, it's just absurd. Obviously, you'd have to have some amazingly strong insulation to uh, create a thermal break in that, in that location. Okay, uh, David Reddy. Um, it seems like it, that should stay, though, to make it clear that it's not required, because otherwise, if you're, by default, it would be maybe considered a mass wall. And is, wasn't that the issue to begin with? It was con that's good, considered that's a good point. Wall. That's a good point to just say that there's no requirement mm -hmm. um, at, at that point. Yeah. Yeah, I think the R5 should stay there. No, not the R5, the no requirement should stay Yeah, there. that's what I agree. And I, I think... Dwayne mentioned, I think what you're trying to say, Patrick, is that you uh, average it out when you use the component method. This is the prescriptive method requirements here. So it's separate. This, the point two it. is still below in the component approach, the 0 0.2. You could still average it prescriptively just by line item. Single component. Weigh, yeah. You couldn't weigh, say, your transfer deck against windows. Person. But if you averaged it and had 
say a non-courtyard building and you had plenty of insulated perimeter against not insulated perimeter, you could average it out to R5 and probably get a prescriptive permit. So um, can I add more detail about that? And then please, Lisa. I, yeah, so and this is a question for the group on this one. So you know, obviously the code allows prescriptive compliance with R values and U factors, right? So you can you can say I comply prescriptively using a U factor or you can comply prescriptively using an R value. Is is there and again, this is to address what Patrick is saying. Okay, if you would like to, uh, oops, <laughs> sorry, Krista, uh, a little typo in, in my proposal. Um, you would still be able to average out prescriptively with a U factor, correct? Yes, how it's done, Lisa, would be, and I don't do it in multifamily, but I do do it in single family where they have over 15% glazing and you have say a bunch of goofy walls or you have to have a two by four wall for some place, you average all the walls. So Patrick, this is the commercial code. That's not um, what we're talking, uh, that's not my question. So let me ask the commercial code. Yeah, let me ask the question again. And I, and actually Chris, I do see um, unfortunately another typo in there. Um, it should say U.2 for both, um, there we go. Thank you. Um, so my question is that if there is an area weighted calculation that's being performed for just the mass transfer slab deck edge, that area weighting calculation can, could, could it be done with U factors only and not R values. Um, and I think what Seattle did here by saying, you know, no, you do not have to put in an insulation, you know, piece of R5 there so that it, the, the problem is, is that when, when you have people that are involved in this, you know, jurisdictions that are reading this, that have found this confusing. And, and we've gotten tech support phone calls from very frustrated structural engineers who are saying this jurisdiction is telling me I have to put a thermal break here because the code says right here, I have to put in an R5. They said that is structurally impossible. Okay. And so that's what this is trying to kind of eliminate is to take that, improve that so that there isn't that confusion. I, okay, I, thank you, Lisa. I would like to, I think we've, we've um, discussed many sides of this um, and I think we're probably ready to move on. So, um, Lisa, I think you, you've suggested a few changes to this. I think the group has suggested a few changes. And I think we will take this up again and hopefully um, we can get agreement in general or at least vote it forward in the future. Hey, can, so, we, can we once again have a, 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 a little show of hands of who's yep. good with the way it is now? Yeah, let's, uh, let's vote with your reactions. Okay, we have lots of, lots of positive, one negative. Um, two negative. So it might not need more discussion. Yep. All right. I well, think it does. I, you guys, I do this all day long. I could clean it up with Lisa and Duane and we'd get it right. That sounds great. And Patrick, why don't you contact Lisa and, um, we, and move, move forward, forward with that? I think it needs a footnote, Lisa. Okay, let's, let's move on. Um, and Patrick, feel free to contact Lisa and um, suggest some changes. I think that would be a great way to, to move forward. Let me know when you'd like me to. <laughs> Go for it, Lisa. Okay, all right. And is that uh, the whole thing? Can you scroll up just a little bit? See the whole thing? Yeah, okay. All right, so this was uh, two different details uh, that uh, again in Seattle, I think I, I liked what they did here. So when we're talking about um, 
you know, specific building thermal envelope insulation requirements. Um, it, it just adds some clarification that, you know, assemblies complying prescriptively with C402.1.4 and buildings complying with C402.1.5. Uh, so it's making it very clear that it's, you know, this applies to all three methods of uh, compliance with the thermal envelope provision. So uh, I, I think that was an omission uh, in the code. So I was glad to see that that was added. And so there's that detail. And then uh, this, the table for the continuous installation um, details, it's a footnote in, in the code, uh, footnote I. Uh, I. I really like this. Uh, it's very nice because it makes it a lot clearer that what this table has, these are continuous installation equivalent values. And then it just makes it really clear, you know, what um, these equivalent values are. Um, how to be used. So that's why we decided to incorporate this from the Seattle code. Great. Are there comments? Questions? Everybody loves it. Everybody loves it. Great. Okay. I'm not hearing, seeing any comments or questions. So I'll move on vestibule clarification actually um so yeah why don't we go to yeah vestibule clarification next one i could i could take this one uh, just a, a common situation that came up was that that a uh, restaurant has a, an outdoor dining area especially lately and it's not really used as a building entrance but um uh, we wanted to clarify that they did not need a vestibule in that situation. I think most building officials would agree that that's not 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 what vestibules were needed for. So I don't know if anybody has an argument with making that one exception. Okay. See no hands, I hear no comments. So I think that sounds that sounds very reasonable. Um, I guess the only the only comment, um, Dwayne, is if you have to go inside the fence in order to get into the main entrance of the of the restaurant or the the space, um, how that would play out. But I guess that's used only to access outdoor well, seating. Yeah. So maybe that would be excluded. I was trying to be very specific there. No. Okay. Well, let's move on then. <clears throat> Data center updates. Yeah. Can you hear me? This is Nick O'Neill. Hi, Nick. Hey. Hey, Joe. Um, Right, so uh, Krista, I just emailed you a slightly updated version of this, um, but it's okay if we can't get to that. Um, we can we can review this one. Oh, great, that'd be even better. Um, yeah, notice one other clarification needed to make. Um, so this, if you remember from the 2018 code cycle, there's a lot of discussion about data center compliance using ASHRAE standard 90.4. Um, so that's what this section is referring to. These are large data centers um, above 20 watts a square foot. Um, and 10 kW load. And in the integrated draft, we aligned with 90.4 version 2019. Um, the previous version aligned with 2016. And so this language cleans up um, references to the new 2019 that, that don't exist anymore. And the, the biggest change between the two uh, versions, 2016 and 2019, was that they removed the design uh, MLC value requirement. There's just an annual requirement now. So all references to design we should take out of the Washington code. Um, so that's the, the additional change I just sent to Krista removes it from the MLC definition up above because I forgot that it, it referenced design. Um, yeah, and I also propose removing the reference of TMY3 in that definition. That doesn't appear anywhere else in the code and it probably shouldn't be restricted to the type of weather data they use. Uh, the other thing that it does is that it, uh, the 2019 version split the data center uh, size into two categories. So it splits it below uh, less than equal to 300 kW of uh, design power or greater than 300 kW of design power. 
So that was not a split that was in the 2016 version. And so what I'm proposing to do is to um, strike all the language with the design and then uh, provide a clarification that the, uh, the MLC values that we agreed to last time of 0.16 should apply to the less than 300 kW uh, data center size. Um, the 2019 version has an even lower MLC value for the greater than 300 kW size. So I'm just proposing to keep that in line with the standard. And if you scroll down to the next page I have in the uh, proposal there, that's what the table that I'm referencing within 90.4 looks like. And down at the bottom, those are the two climate zones and what I'm proposing to, to modify there. Right. So I uh, question for you, in the Seattle code, we just decided to get rid of all of those. Um, uh, if you scroll back up to the, uh, the, we got rid of all of the, the changes to what well, just in the, in the new 90.4 and and didn't see, it seemed like it was well thought out and we didn't need to put in our own slightly different values. So is there some reason that we need to put in the 0.16? Well, so that's what we agreed to last time for all data centers, regardless of size. Uh, if you, sorry, Krista, if you scroll back down to that table, what you'll see is that what 90.4 recommends for those large, smaller data centers is as high as 0.23. Um, which seemed pretty high, uh, 300 kW data center is still almost 90 tons of cooling. Um, so it's well, not a small, that, small data center. That, that was my, my point entirely, was that, that they're, they didn't just do this randomly. They recognized that, whereas we just had a broad brush look at trying to give everything a number, they mm -hmm. recognized that the smaller data centers have different needs. And, and I don't know that we have the expertise in, in-house here to say that they were wrong about that. Right, so I, I've been on a bunch of 90.4 calls recently with the committee to look at this and the, the question I asked them was how they came up with this value. And this was back in, you know, this actually was done back in 2016 when they had a lot of these edge data centers that they were nested in buildings, in office buildings. And they found that a 300 kW you know, load was, was representative of those data centers. And the reason that they chose this higher value is because they felt it was hard to um, install economizers, airside economizers in those rooms uh, to comply. And so their reasoning for the higher value was that it was difficult to install those. And so they should get a pass on the MLC value. So that, that seemed like a kind of a, an easy out for those data centers. I, I agree that if the data center is very small, uh, it's hard to comply with strict MLC values. But, but again, these aren't computer rooms. These are these are dense data centers, um, and the MLC requirements can be met with an airside economizer. They can be met with more efficient equipment. They can be met with more efficient um, uh, use of waste heat recovery, things like that nature. So. I'm, st I'm still talking with the 90.4 committee on this, but since we agreed to the 0.16 in the integrated draft, I, I was proposing to just keep that um, and just recommend that this is, you know, applied to the um, to the data center that, that we're not weakening requirements here with uh, with allowing a higher MLC value here for these smaller data centers. Right. So the 0.16 we agreed to was for all data centers everywhere, right? Not yes. for large and small. And, and so, uh, it, it it seems like if if 23 is too high that that it doesn't necessarily mean that that the, the 0.16 makes any kind of sense for a, a smaller data center so I'm, I'm just worried that we're we're losing track of, of the reality of how these things are built and 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 unless somebody has personal expertise in doing data center cooling, systems and can say with conviction that the 0.16 is fine. I'm a little worried about overriding ASHRAE. I'm going to call on Mike Kennedy now. Yeah, I guess I, I just wanted to comment that the IECC has 0.16 for all data centers. So it would apply to small ones and large ones. And I don't know why we'd want to increase that number. Um, Generally, the integrated draft has 0.16 because the IECC had 0.16. Right, right. So uh, somebody's, to Dwayne's question, somebody 
thought about it. Yeah, at some level. Um, well, yeah, I mean, to, to be fair, the IECC is, is pulling from the Washington, you know, the Washington 2018 Washington code went ahead of IECC. So we're, <laughs> we're all pointing fingers yes. to each other. <laughs> we, we did it first and then they yeah. copied us and now we're copying it back. So I guess, Dwayne and Mike, do you think that you need to work with Nick and figure out what the right number is? Or do you think this can be solved easily today? I, I am willing to, to go with other people who know what they're talking about, which would not be me. And I just want to make sure that somebody who's, who's proposing these numbers for the small data centers knows that ASHRAE 90.4 committee had it wrong or intends to change theirs or something uh, to, to, uh, uh, to override that. Yeah, I, I'm open to, to, to friendly amendments on this. There, the other option that we looked at was to just lower the threshold. So instead of having it at 0.23 MLC for 300 kW, we would bump it down to about 100 kW. That's much more in line with a small data center load. Um, but I haven't gotten information back from the 90.4 committee on um, uh, on what that looks like. They, they they have that same split for the UPS system. So I was proposing to align it for the mechanical systems as well. So they have lesser requirements for UPS systems at that break point. That's what that I'm saying. Is, I would suggest that 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 shall you put this on hold until un, until uh, uh, Nick has heard back from 90.4. I think that's a good idea. So we will bring this up. We'll go over this again and we have comments for Nick and Nick if you can come back with more info later I think that'd be great okay <laughs> sounds good okay um it's 10 o'clock and we had um someone who said that they needed to leave uh reasonably soon so um that is Sean Deniston with uh, proposal 97 on thermostats so um can we jump to that right now? All right, Sean, are you? I am here and thank you for accommodating me. I do very much appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Hi, do you want to walk us through the this? Sure. Um, as we continue toward Washington's goals, we see that grid flexibility is going to become an increasing important piece of uh, meeting those goals, especially as we think about the impact of carbon and not just energy. And so what this does is it ensures that thermostats that are used in commercial buildings have dem demand responsive capabilities. Uh, and this is for two reasons. One, so that we have that grid flexibility moving into the future and these and buildings can be more responsive to the conditions on the grid as that becomes more and more critical. Uh, but there's also a cost element to this as utilities move more and more to time of use charge uh, rate structures. Uh, this will also be a little bit of future proofing for buildings to ensure that they're able to take advantage of the best rate structures possible. Um, there is an exception for healthcare and assisted living facilities, just recognizing that space conditioning in those facilities might be considered part of the healthcare. And we don't wanna mess with that. We wanna just kind of stay out of that issue. And then um, I think the, as far as a little bit of other background, the definition that's being introduced for demand responsive control, this comes from Title 24, uh, the, the functionality that's in here, the four degrees uh, adjustability also comes from Title 24. Um, one reason is, you know, then this is a vetted approach to this type of requirement, uh, but it also then aligns Washington's requirements with what is already the largest market for demand responsive controls uh, out there right now. If you look um, you often see in thermostats whether or not they are Title 24 compliant. So it's an easy way to see if thermostats would be meeting this requirement. Thanks, Sean. Um, Lisa. 
Uh, yeah, I, I just have one uh, comment. I, I, I like this proposal. I think, it was, I think it's a good idea. Um, it's just the, um, for the exception, um, healthcare probably should clarify that a little further. Um, you know, are we talking hospitals? Are we talking ambulatory care? Are we talking, uh, you know, any, any type of healthcare? So that would be mm -hmm. uh, as a friendly amendment perhaps to add some more clarity about um, the scope of that uh, that term with regards to the exception. Okay. Uh, Mike Kennedy. Yeah, Sean, I guess I, um, have you looked at whether uh, equipment with integral thermostats like, I you know, package terminal heat pumps and uh, uh, ductless heat pumps, whether this is something they can do? Sean? Sorry about that. I had a very inopportune network issue. Uh, so I just missed what happened in the last probably 10, 15 seconds. Uh, Mike Kennedy asked a question. Yeah, I asked a question about um, whether you looked at, um, I guess, package terminal heat pumps, ductless heat pumps, uh, equipment that has kind of integral thermostats, essentially. Can they, are they, are we going to be excluding them from being able to meet this requirement? I mean, by um, having. They are not excluded in Title 24, I think. Um, I can look into that to get a better sense. Yeah, those are they being thermostats are, are they being excluded by having this requirement? I guess that's the question. Mm -hmm. I don't know uh, the answer to that, so I, but I can find this out. This is Chris Burroughs. I, I kind of do know the answer. I ran the PSD ductless heat pump program uh, for five years. And that would be my big worry is that by, uh, by doing this, um, ductless heat pumps don't have that control capability. They're usually controlled on a percentage of on versus a temperature that you're setting in a building. Um, so that would probably be one of my major concerns with this uh, proposal. And is the concern for these only within dwelling units in residential occupancies or also in the other occupancies? I mean, it, it, it could, it depends. Like that's, that's where I've had my most um, experience with, but when you get into commercial, they're, they're stuck with the RF systems. And I, I would definitely think at least it would be worth some more research to figure out what percentage of systems uh, could or could not comply with this uh, requirement. Um, Dwayne, you have your hand up. Yeah, uh, my, my question is whether this is just that piece of gear on the wall or does it require, I, I'm not sure how the, how the signal gets from the utility that's having the emergency to the, to the thermostat and what other infrastructure is required and that's not explicit in this amendment. Right, so generally what happens is there's the functionality within the control device that actually allows this to happen. Uh, usually there is a, a communications bridge is probably the best way to characterize it that makes that connection between the control device and however the, um, the demand signal is being sent, whether it's increasingly, it's generally over the internet, but it's not always. So this doesn't get into, you know, that the device actually needs to be, uh, have that communications device since that does tend to vary by who's issuing the demand signal. So it's just control functionality in this case. I guess, I guess trying to think along the same lines, is this the BMS having the functionality or all terminal thermostats that are anywhere in a building? So the way that this is, phrased, it would apply to BMSs. So if the BMS had the capability, then the individual thermostats that might be in spaces would not need to. Right, and, and, and that's the point of the, the phrasing the way it is, that the thermostat shall be provided with, um, so that it's rather than that the thermostat has to be 
Okay. Um, we have Elizabeth Joyce. Yeah, um, just to the comment that was brought up around um, kind of package units um, or units that might have an integral thermostat. Um, I pulled up the Title 24 language and the way that it's defined, at least in Title 24, is um, it's defined as for non-residential HVAC systems with DDC to the zone. And that's a phrase that's used pretty commonly throughout Title 24. Um, they could be here but, as soon as three or four minutes. Are we ready to go? Oh, Dwayne, um, uh, can you mute Dwayne? But, you know, and I know that there's a lot of other ways that, that phrase is used within Title 24, but I wonder if there might be a similar um, ability to add, add kind of similar language in here that addresses that um, issue. Right. Yeah, so that might be a suggestion for Sean to, um, Thank yeah. you, we can take a closer look at that. I also saw um, that there's a, a question from Austin in the chat about uh, having the heating set point down to 60 and cooling turned off. And uh, the main reason for that is the, the main point with demand response is not to, you know, we're moving to the point where we don't want to just shut equipment down or make large changes. We want to make small changes to a lot of equipment for a big impact. And then just the reality that because there's uh, equipment precedent already in the market, that this is the functionality that we're seeing in terms of availability. And so we kind of want to make sure that if this requirement goes into place, we have the widest possible number of um, pieces of equipment that will need it. And if we did something like that, I'm, I've not seen that functionality in demand responsive controls. And so we might be requiring something uh, that only a more complex logic driven system could actually meet. Okay, uh, Chris and Mike, your hands are still up. I don't know if you still have questions, but Chris, if you have still have a question or comment, go for it. Yeah, I do have some additional comments or questions. I guess um, one of my, uh, just a comment is I don't know that we should necessarily rely on Title 24 as they've edited it, so we should do it. Um, in my experience working with their requirements and moving up to Washington, sometimes they're not the best resource to rely on for setting requirements, especially around demand response. Um, and then the other thing uh, would be if we require something in code now, one thing I've seen is contractors just throw the cheapest thing in there that in three years when PSE does have a demand response program, our communications protocol isn't going to work with it and they're going to have to replace it anyway. So I don't know if there's anything we can do about that, but that is a large concern when you start requiring uh, controls protocols that are supposed to work with a with the utility program that's uh, upcoming. Chris, do you have any any insight into when those programs would, would roll out? Uh, you know, it, it's a couple of years, but it's been a couple of years for, for a while. Um, we've gone to bid a couple of times and that we've never been able to get uh, a, a cost competitive um, program off the ground, but we continue to try it. So that's kind okay. of as close as I can come to something. Okay, I guess one more question for you, Chris, which is, it says demand signal. Is that clear enough to what is actually this? Well, I, I like that it is, yeah, I like that it's generic because what we've run into the past is when you get too specific with that with it, and then when the, a totally new, brand new, much better protocol comes out two years from now, and everybody switches to that, and now it's obsolete. So I kind of like the, the the fact that it does not defining any types of uh, actual protocols. Should it say utility demand signal or something that's more clear, or is it abundantly hmm. vague and clear? Yeah, that that may be. Yeah, so, that, that, that may be worth thinking about. We, we intentionally genericized uh, this definition from California because we felt it was too specific. What we are seeing through NBI is running our, our grid optimal initiative where we're learning a lot about how mm -hmm. to integrate buildings into the grid and that the way that uh, entities, I'll say, are considering how to do demand response is going beyond just utilities. And so I don't think we want to limit this to just utilities. Um, you know, we're seeing ESCOs are considering using it and, and other entities. And okay, so we, we were more specific and then we went more generic. Okay. Um, I guess uh, you, 
if there's no more substantive comments on this, do you have some homework for you, Sean? It sounds like it. We're happy to um, do it. I think defining healthcare better, uh, de determining if this excludes common mechanical systems because they can't provide the capability, and um, perhaps adding DDC language uh, from Title 24 or considering that that Elizabeth may comment on. Are there other suggestions to improve this um, that we can give to Sean today? I would just, I would like to be, offer my help if he has any questions or anything and wants to get a deeper utility perspective. I have other resources I can bring in and we can talk further about it. Thank you very much for that. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Um, thanks, Sean. Uh, this Thank is you. a very you know, forward looking proposal and I like it. All right, let's go back to our clarifications and uh, um, miscellaneous mechanical editorial is the next one. And the proponent is Lisa again. Yes, thank you. Uh, so this is a combination. Uh, some of these are uh, pickups that uh, ETC put together uh, based on feedback that we've been getting through tech support. Some details that there's a little bit of confusion. So we thought we'd try to take care of some of these things. And then some of these came from the Seattle Energy Code. So it's a combination. So uh, shall I go through each one individually? I think quickly, relatively, um, yep. and then we'll see through. if there's any comments. Okay, that sounds good. Um, so the first one uh, for the zone isolation required, uh, this one, uh, just adding some clarification that uh, uh, with regards to you know, what we're talking about with regards to zones, and that they are intended to be occupied uh, simultaneously, that's what we're talking about, um, and that uh, the total combined area of those uh, spaces that are intended to be occupied simultaneously does not exceed 25,000 uh, square feet. So that's what that clarification is about. Great, I see no reactions. So we'll, we'll assume that that means that there's, there's general assent. Great, okay. Uh, and then this one for DDC controls and DDC, DDC display, uh, there are, uh, this is something that we've been working on over the last couple of code cycles. There was a lot of language in the code that would made reference to um, uh, which is kind of vague and not really enforceable necessarily. And, uh, and so this was something that came from the uh, commissioning uh, folks that recommended that that language be changed to configured to. And so uh, this is just picking that up in, this, in these two provisions that requires the PC controls to be configured to perform these functions that are in the code. Not just that, capable. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Seems like more of the intent. intent. Yes. And then under third controls, uh, this came from the Seattle Energy Code. Uh, exception number two has always been kind of difficult to understand. And so that Seattle came up with uh, a, a better, Seattle came up with a, a better uh, definite or de better uh, description of this exception. And so it, it doesn't really change the intent. Uh, it, it, other than it does make it clear that the interior zone and perimeter zone, if, if they're open to each other, with permanent only um, larger than 10%, it does it does incorporate that detail. Actually, no, that's already there. And so really this is just, uh, you know, just writing it in a better way so that it's more clear. Sounds good, I see no reactions, positive or negative. So we'll assume that that means that they're all positive. Great. Oh, Mike Kennedy. Uh, oh. No, sorry, that's for this next item. Okay. okay. <laughs> Great, okay. Looking forward to the comment. So uh, this one for allowable fan motor horsepower, um, this is adding, a this again, is also from the Seattle Energy Code. This is adding clarification for the individual exhaust fans. Um, there is an exception for uh, those uh, fans with nameplate horsepower 
of one horsepower or less. So it doesn't change that, uh, but it does make it clear that fractional horsepower motors do have to comply with the requirements for C405.8. So it's just a way of pointing over to another area. So it's saying that those fans are not off the hook uh, with regards to requirements in the energy code. It just uh, doesn't have to meet this particular provision. Mike. Um, I, I'm not sure how many of the exhaust fans covered by C40384 would fall into systems with in this situation, but exhaust fans also have to comply with 403.8.4. Ah. You might look at that. Well, are you suggesting a friendly amendment to um, say that however these fans shall comply with section C40 3.4 and C405.8, is that your suggestion? I suppose, yeah, C403.8.4. Yeah, I, I, I accept that as a friendly amendment. Dwayne, do you have any comment on this? Because this came from Seattle. I know Dwayne was gonna board a plane around 9.30, so. Ah, uh, so he may not be there, okay. No. I mean, technically they have to do that anyway, but it, since we're clarifying by to leave out that other section seems a little yeah misdirection yeah no i that's i i that's a friendly minute. that's great steam condensate systems unless there's any other i don't see any other hands up okay yeah so for this provision um Gosh, I think, you know, three times a charm on this one. Uh, this is something that has been incorrect energy code and I think it goes all the way back to 2012. It was corrected in the 2015 code during the tag process and then somehow it got, it got muddled. And then that happened again in 2018. I think Eric Vandermey has submitted the proposal for this back in 2018. So uh, all this is, is just trying to, to make sure that the correction that was proposed in the 2018 code gets into the 2021. And what it's basically saying is that what's incorrect about this language is that it's basically saying that if you have a, um, if, if it doesn't have, if, if, if the, the steam system uh, does not have uh, you know, on, offsite energy, it, it's, I'm sorry, let me read it again. Yeah, I think, I think, I think it's a good clarification. Yeah, yeah, it, it's not- The original language is unclear. That's right. It doesn't require condensate water recovery. It requires condensate water um, heat recovery yep. system. <laughs> and that was always the intent of this provision. We're just trying to make sure that it gets in there. No, nope. any, I don't see any hands up, sorry. And I think this is a very reasonable clarification. Okay. Heat traps. Heat traps. So this one, um, these, uh, again, uh, is a clarification in the Seattle Energy Code that just makes it clear that the heat trap um, is required on the uh, vertical inlets and outlets uh, to the water heater. I see no comments or questions. That means uh, we can move on. Okay. And then, um, under C4011.2 for minimum area, um, there it, it does state for the 40% of the roof area, um, and it gives a clarification that uh, that is uh, less any area covered by skylights and occupied roof decks and planted areas, and the Seattle Energy Code added mechanical equipment to that list. And then for the exception, uh, it, it, they added the term, instead of saying uh, subject to the approval of the code, uh, we believe that it, the intention was that he was supposed to be code official. So That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that's a clarification too. Okay, I see no comments and questions and this seems very common sense, so. Um, Great. All right, awesome. Thank you, Lisa, for clarifying the code for everybody. Okay, HVAC reorganization. Okay, uh, so this one, 
I'm, I'm trying to tackle a detail that came out of the reorganization for the mechanical chapter in the 2018 code. So um, if you, let's see, can you scroll up a little bit? Let's see. To the top, there we go. Um, yeah, okay. So what we're trying to address here are, I'll, I'll call them buried requirements, where you've got a title for a section, it's talking about one thing, and then there's a buried requirement within that provision that really should stand by itself so that people can find it. Because these details, you know, when they're kind of buried in a provision like that, they get missed. And, so, and we hear it all the time. And so, uh, so what this one does is the uh, language regarding gas fired and oil fired uh, air furnaces that has been buried inside the uh, HVC equipment performance requirements provision for a long time. And we're proposing to pull that out as a separate section so it's easier to find. There's no changes to the language. It's just pulling it out as its own section. Um, and then the other detail here, uh, let's I'm trying to remember if I show, I think I do down deeper in the proposal, do I show uh, the section where it's, yeah, I show where it's struck. So. In section C403.6.7, um, again, I just think that this was a result of when the, they did the reorganization, that this was a Seattle requirement um, where it had, it talked about, uh, you know, large uh, cooling capacity systems, uh, what some of the uh, limitations are for that. And it's just put in this odd provision the title doesn't really talk about that requirement. It just generically says hydronic and multiple zone HVAC um, system control requirements shall, shall comply with this section. And then it points to this one detail. So it's just really kind of in a weird place and it's not very clear. So if you scroll back up, um, what we're proposing is to take that language about um, buildings with these large cooling capacity systems and put it in its own section with a very clear title that shows exactly what's going on inside that uh, provision. And then further down by making these two changes, then that means the uh, section number for chillers uh, just has to be revised. So that, that's the extent of the proposal. Does anybody have any comments? And I'm looking specifically at our mechanical engineers. Elizabeth, does this seem like a common sense thing, reasonable thing? Uh, yes, yeah. Awesome. Okay, thank you. Um, I see no comments, I see no questions. So this seems to be a, a good path forward. Great, thank okay. you. All right, next one is threshold for variable flow. This is a Dwayne one. This is a, one. Yeah, this is a Dwayne one. So Dwayne is flying somewhere now. Um, so maybe we'll skip this one and go to Air Intake Editorial, which is Alexander Ratcliffe. Is Alexander present? Yep, I'm here. All right. Do you want to walk us through? So a very simple revision, um, just an erroneous reference in the revised code where it's saying that section C 403.7.9 is where you would for damper requirements where the correct section is 403.7.8. Anybody have any objections to correcting a second section reference? Okay, awesome, flying colors, good job. Boiler Efficiency Federal Updates. Yeah, this, this is a proposal to update the boiler efficiencies to the current um, Department of Energy standards. Um, 
The standards passed in January of 2020, so they were not part of ASHRAE 90.1 2019, where our current efficiency tables have come from. Um, they take effect on January 10, 2023, um, which is, I believe, before this code would ever get enacted. Yep, this code would be July 1st of 23. Right, so these would be the, these are the new national standard uh, efficiency requirements. So it's somewhat important to get them in code. So other over code performance in C406 is using the proper base. Um, I think if to the extent that we're comfortable saying this code is going to go into effect after January 2023, I would take this column and make it, you know, only have a single efficiency column in this table and make that the minimum efficiency column. Um, that would make sense. I don't think there's any, any, Krista, maybe you can answer, but I don't think there's any reasonable way this is going to go into effect before July 1, 23. No. So let's remove that <clears throat> column and remove the 1, 1, 2023 part of the efficiency. Um, minimum, just call it minimum efficiency. And are there any other comments or questions about this one? Chris. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> um, so we're sure the federal standard is going to change. It's not like politics could step in the way and, and make, stop that from happening or uh, anything like that. You just don't want to get ahead. Published to the federal register in January. As a, as okay, a final cool. Final determination. Mm -hmm. um, it had gone through, Perfect. I believe there was a lawsuit that was then somehow resolved, and that's when it got published. Cool. All right. Okay. If for some reason it didn't go into effect, I suppose we can do an emergency revision, but. Yeah, I, I believe we can change the code off cycle due to federal laws and state laws, so. Okay, duct insulation clarification. This is yeah, Elisa. Uh-huh, okay. this was actually a, um, a tag assignment. It came out of our March meeting. So uh, the this section in the, the code, uh, it was, it's confusing because it, it appears to require the that the ductwork meet the requirement of section C402 um, when we believe the intent is that the shafts and plenum surfaces, they are required to come in section C402 and that all of the outside air ductwork is required to comply with the insulation requirements in the table. And so uh, this is just taking the, uh, the IECC, the model code language, and clarifying it. Mike, did you have any, I'd like to see if Mike has any comments about this because he and I both had, uh, this was kind of pointed to us after the TAG meeting. I, I read through it and it seemed all right, Lisa. I didn't read it super close. Okay, great. Thank you. I guess I have one question is ducts is still in the title, but are ducts covered in 403.10.1.1 as marked up? Okay, there we are. Yep. Yeah, I tried to kind of keep it all together um, versus breaking it up yep. into separate subsections. And it seemed to work okay this way. I wonder if duct work should be ducts. Oh, yeah. Okay. I, I, I accept that as a friendly amendment. Oh, that, there's another one down below. Actually, um, that's in the model code language down in section C403.10.2. That's the, the model code says uses duct work. Do you think it should be uh, just say ducts there too, Mike? I uh, I don't know. Um, 
I was just going because of the title, but I mean, the engineers might know whether ducts or duct work would be the better term. I contend duct work is more appropriate than ducts for 403.10.2. I would agree. So that means I'd not make the uh, proposed change in the sentence above as well, or the section above? For the two folks that piped up. No comment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to read it over in my head and I haven't, uh, yeah, I can't decide which. Yeah. Seems like either one would be okay. It, to me, they they seem relatively interchangeable. Exactly. Yeah. Just keep yeah. them the same, right? Yeah, I think ductwork implies something a little bit more complete, but I don't think it's a problematic um, replacement either way okay well then i i would say yes it's you know i would be fine with accepting that as a friendly amendment to you know change it from ductwork to ducks but we'll leave it as ductwork in the uh section c40310 to just keep the model code language fine there sounds good is, sorry this is nick i, I was just going to say the, the one clarification of this is that duct is a defined term in the wsec ductwork is not so if you're if you're gonna use duct, you might have to italicize it. Ah, uh, good, good, good catch. All right, Kennedy. Yeah. Um, I guess I, I wondered, Lisa, whether uh, this could be two subsections: one being for shafts and plenums, and one for ducts. And if duct construction, is that apply to shafts and plenums or just ducts? And if it's just ducts, then it could be part of that subsection. I, I, I don't know enough about what, what really here a shaft and a plenum versus a duct is, so. It, the, the divine term says tube or conduit utilized for conveying air. So I think you could say a, a shaft would be considered a duct in that case. And, and the duct construction section, then it refers to, you know, how it, it's actually assembled. Um, and it's, but it talks about duct sections and duct wall penetrations and all that. It doesn't really get into shafts and plenums. So to your point, it, Dwayne, I, I mean, uh, uh, Mike, it's, it's, I think that one's clear. Um, so what you're suggesting is, would be to have a, a, a section called shafts and plenums and have that language about shafts and plenums and then have another section it's, which is C40310.1.1 with um, the duct language and the duct construction underneath it. Is that what you're proposing? Well, I guess it just came up because of the initial question that came up is are ducts covered here? And it seemed like, oh, well, that could be a separate subsection. I see. Just to clarify that. Um, and then the duct construction, maybe it's good to the where it is and it applies to both. Yeah, I think it does. So I guess my, my I, I think it's fine. Um, I would not number the exceptions because there's only one. Take S off exceptions and then just put it in the same line just the way it is in the previous sentence. If there's only one exception, yeah. then you know, we don't need the, the one. And then the, the, the exception could be written out right, right next to it. Right, right. Yeah, that's, that's better. I agree. It would be more clear that the exception then applies to ducts and not to yeah. chefs and plumbers. So. So Mike, I, I guess uh, I'd be open to either way. I, let's let's leave it as it is. OK. Krista, could you make the suggestions that I, or make the? Sure, just a second.
And then um, I was thinking taking a break at 11 to 11.30, but last week there was um, a mutiny and we decided to take a break from 11.30 to noon um, while Chris is doing this. Uh, how many people would be, uh, would want to take a break at 11? Use your, use your reactions. Okay, and how many people would rather take a break at 11.30? Okay, the 11.30s have it. Um, good, okay. That just means we will have gone for three and a half hours without a break. Why don't we take a, like a two minute break or a three minute break right now? Um, Make it make it a very short two to three minute break. All right, welcome back, um, Lisa. If you're around, then um, you want to walk us through this next one. Yeah, it's too short of a break. Hey, Lisa, are you back? We'll wait another minute. I am back, sorry. <laughs> Go for it, Lisa. Uh, yeah, so this is, uh, it's a correction, uh, we believe. Uh, if you look at the language in the 2015 code, the detail that is in section or in item number eight, uh, it's a standalone item. And then number nine is a standalone item. But in the 2021, or actually the 2018 code, and, and it was repeated in the 2021 code, those two details were combined into one item. Uh, and we have received some questions about that. So we're just proposing to make that correction. Uh, that also now means that all the other subsequent uh, items have to be renumbered. Mike Kennedy. Uh, I think this is a good change, Lisa. I think the link, and this is wrong, and I think it should be C403.8.1 rather than .1.1. Oh, okay. Let me and see. I, I believe that's wrong in the in the current code as well. Uh, oh, good catch. Uh, okay. And I, I obviously accept that as a friendly amendment. Any other comments or questions? Okay, are we done with this one? Great, thank you. All right. Next one is a lighting editorial. This is also by Lisa. You've been very busy. <clears throat> yeah, definitely. We did, did some great coordination with the CDCL. Uh, yeah, so most, I think, yeah, most of these are from the city of Seattle. Uh, there are a couple details here, again, were from our tech support. So under the time switch control function, uh, Seattle Energy Code uh, does add to the exception uh, where uh, time switch controls would not be required. Currently in the code, it says small concourses, auditorium, sales areas, manufacturing facilities, and they include 
pools, gymnasiums, and skating rinks, all for the same reason is that you, you don't want the lights turning off automatically um, if somebody's in any of those space types. So that's the purpose of that change. Mike, do you have your hand up? All right, it's down. Go ahead, Lisa. Uh, again, this is our, uh, an update from the Seattle Energy Code for daylight responsive controls. Uh, they add some clarification to the exception for satellite daylight zones in the first floor above grade for group A2 and group M. Uh, they clarify that uh, where the fenestration adjoins a sidewalk or other outdoor pedestrian area, uh, making it very, very clear the scope of this exception. Um, and then it also adds the clarification that those fixtures also need to be controlled separately from general area lighting, uh, which is also a very good um, uh, clarification. Uh, make sure that those lights, uh, they may be accepted or ex exempted, uh, but they need to be controlled separately. Okay, I see no comments or questions. Uh, this one here under additional interior lighting, really, it's just a typo, basically. Um, you know, there's an exception here for uh, other merchandise categories. And at the bottom it says, you know, or other critical display is approved by the code official and it, it, it's, uh, they just add the word requirement. So it's clear what we're talking about. So that's just a- that makes sense. A word in there. Um, and then the next one, C405.5.2, uh, they add the word uh, exterior lighting, just making it very clear uh, that mm -hmm. we are talking, that's what we're talking about is only exterior lighting that needs to be uh, included in that calculation. So of a minor pickup. And then uh, this one, I'm actually would be very interested in hearing the opinion of some of the lighting folks in the group. So uh, they also make this change for the exterior lighting power allowance. Talking about item number two says the exterior lighting needs to be, um, you yeah. um, let me make sure I get this right. Ah, I see. So for this particular detail, when we're talking about the exterior area, um, they add the clarification that a covered parking garage lighting is not considered exterior lighting for the purpose of that calculation. So they're making it clear, um, and I can see that this could be confusing, that um, uh, if you get a parking garage, it's the top floor is considered exterior because it's exterior, um, there's nothing uh, above it, but the um, covered parking areas, even if it has, you know, it's open to the ambient, um, that lighting is still covered under interior parking garage lighting. So they're making that clarification here. This is coming from Seattle? Yes. No. I guess I don't know what practice normally is um, for this, but it, if it is in fact a clarification, then um, CJ had to step away. Yeah. So this, this might be worth... Um, this is this is the way the code reads. There's the indoor lighting table has a parking garage values. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's an ASHRAE thing. Yeah, and the code doesn't say enclosed versus non enclosed or whatever. It just basically says you know interior parking garage is it's been interpreted as it's it's covered parking area. And so the Seattle just want to make sure that that was, that was clear with this addition. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I don't see any comments or questions. So let's, let's, for David Reddy. Okay. Um, <clears throat> when you say, uh, so would a, like a carport uh, on a multifamily building parking area be covered uh, under the interior lighting power allowance then? That's our interpretation is that if okay. it's a covered carport, then yeah, it would be considered um, 
part of the interior lighting, light, interior lighting power allowance would apply. Well, I'm saying carport. I don't know, Mike, what's your interpretation on that? Would that fall under the same? Um, I mean, technically, yeah. Okay, I mean, I think I mean, so too. I just make it sure. I, I would be glad lumping it as parking lot. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have, this has actually always bugged me that 90.1 put it in the interior lighting budget. Uh, mm -hmm. um, but it seems like parking garages mm -hmm. ought to be in exterior because as we've already talked about, most of them are exterior. Yeah, they're open to ambient. But that would be a bigger change. Yeah, I, I, did, I didn't go there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Years. Okay, great. All right, let's move on. Okay, last one again, just real small, um, you know, for those escalators and moving walks. There's not very many of those, but there are some. Um, they just, Seattle said, uh, you know, a variable voltage drive system that reduces operating voltage in response to lighting loads is allowed to be provided in lieu of the variable speed control. I think that is what the intent was of the exception, it just wasn't worded very well. So they improved the language. It's good to me. Any, I don't see any comments or questions, so. All right. Great, and thank now, you. Now we get to discuss uh, pipe length. And that is a Duane one. <clears throat> So maybe we'll defer that and go to roof retrofit. Mm -hmm. That's Lisa again. Sorry to unmute, um, came up quick. Okay, yeah, so this is one, uh, Actually, this is an ETC proposal. Um, I did coordinate with Dwayne Jolin on this one uh, because this is, uh, I think, the way the city of Seattle handles it as well. Um, let's see. I'm sorry. Yeah, this is actually, no, this, this detail uh, did come from Seattle. This is a Seattle idea. So, uh, but we have had uh, received a lot of. Uh, jurisdiction question about this detail. So what they proposed under the roof replacement, and I include a lot of other language in here uh, so that for the benefit of the tag, they could understand like how this all comes together in the code. Uh, but for roof replacement, what it says in there is that uh, we have to bring it up to the current code. If the, so if you're doing a, a, a roof replacement is the process of removing the existing roof covering, repairing any damaged substrate and then installing a new roof covering. So that's, that's the scope of the project that we're talking about. And currently uh, that roof only has to be brought up to full compliance with the current code if um, it is uh, installation entirely above deck. And the question we get from jurisdictions is uh, well, what if the building has no insulation at all or even a minor amount of insulation? And so if you read through the language in the code, it's not really clear if, if you have a roof and you just wanna repair, do the roof replacement part of it, not a repair, but replacement, and you don't have any insulation at all in that roof, does it trigger the requirement to add insulation and the city of Seattle reads it that it does, uh, but we have received many questions from jurisdictions asking whether they can enforce that or not. So this clarifies that detail. Any questions or comments on this? Okay. Good clarification. Thank you. Well, the last clarification we have is Appendix F. 
That is Mike Fowler. Yeah, Appendix S F has um, the years between going out to 2030. We've now passed the 2018 code cycle. So this proposal is just to remove that column. It's no longer necessary. And then move the current over to the heading of 2021. That would make sense. And and so the, the intent is 2018 doesn't refer to the year, it just refers to the code. Correct. Right. Yep. Okay. Then that makes sense. Any comments or questions? Well. And, and the only thing I would add is, uh, Chell last week, I think it was, you published or you shared what the, um, some EUI values for what the 2018 code is. And this table has everything below that value. Um, the only diff the only one is not is for a retail. And that's in this, there was a strip mall and standalone that were at 35 and 36 EUIs. And the 2021 value I've just noticed is at 42. Um, so if there was a, I would, if I was submitting it now with that information, I would have changed the retail um, to, to say say thirty five, so that it's not so, so that there's not something above what we've what has been determined to be um, the twenty eighteen code, so, so that it, that doesn't provide a door to go backwards. Everything else has got EUI values below what the twenty eighteen code was saying. That would seem um, reasonable. Is that in the? So I would change. I might, you know, so because if I was, if I had that information from last week, I would have changed this that column to say thirty-five, and then do like a thirty-three, thirty-one, twenty-nine, or or whatever that says. That says twenty-six. Okay, Chris, is that that's something we can do, right? That kind of kicks it out of editorial and more into proposal. Uh, territory, so which would require the economic workup. Yeah, and it's this is one that is just. It's, but if yeah. if a jurisdiction does adopt this appendix, it it, it applies. Um, but that's well, that was the only thing that I because once once you shared that last week, Chell, I went and compared the values, and that's that's the only category that has something potentially higher than what um, code okay. you know, code would code would deliver. Okay, Mike Kennedy. Yeah, I want to, I guess, to ask Mike Fowler a question. Um, this path allows unlimited solar in the goal of meeting these EUIs? Or un unlimited renewables? Uh, it doesn't allow unlimited, no. Okay, is there, what's the limit? Uh, from memory, 20% you could offset. Okay, so quite a bit more than the other EUI paths that we're on, like C407 is, is limited to what, 3%? Yeah, actually, yeah. Okay, all right, thanks. Okay, all right, well, let's, let's accept this as it is as a um, as an editorial uh, and clarification. And then I guess we could ask uh, Mike or Mike Fowler to come back with one that aligns with um, the legislative report from 2018 if we wanted, um, but then some economic data would need to be submitted. You want to- uh, I mean, we're past that proposal date. So I don't know if that's, a feasible thing <laughs> to make a brand new proposal. Um, Krista, what do you think? I think if we're asking him for an update to it, we would he would get the 30 day extension just like anybody else with a proposal that we deem to be incomplete. Mike, do you want 30 days to come up with some economic data? <clears throat> Um, I don't know what the economic data is. <laughs> Why don't we uh, task you with that and then um, you and I or, or others can, can talk offline about what that means. That sound good? Yeah, the cost, I mean, 
it's it's all new construction, so cost is a matter of prioritizing. <laughs> yeah. Eric. Hey, hey Shell, I'm, I'm assuming these values were like how were they calculated? 2021 through 2024. Is it just an extrapolation is to get there? Is it, it was uh, the 2003 was, was taken from data that was 2003 uh, for the region, um, and then the 70 percent goal reduction is the 2030, and it was the incremental progress to get out that that far. That's what I was. That's what I was thinking. So it, it's more of an arbitrary value anyway. So if we change it, or, or Mike presents something that we agree upon changing it. They're more arbitrary, right? It's just right. And I'm gonna, I'll say our our energy code has made faster progress on retail than other locations. Um, so look, retail is ahead of our progress of meeting the 2030 goal, our 2030 70 percent reduction. So retail is ahead. So this would that would it would be catching it up. Um, that's the only category where this table is um, say behind where the state is in terms of code. 10 4. Thank you. All right, Mike Kennedy, do you still have a question? Okay. All right. Sorry. Um, no worries. Uh, all right. So we're kind of going to move forward with, with this, and we're asking um, Mr. Fowler to possibly revise this. Chris. Yeah, sorry. Just a quick, uh, quick comment. Um, should we make sure if we do if we redo one with some methodology, shouldn't we keep that methodology and redo them all? It just seems weird having one that's separate that we came to it a different way than having the rest of them. Yeah, so I think the others are all ahead of our our code. <laughs> our code is not yeah gone far enough. So that retail is the only one where this category is not. Um, our code has progressed faster than what was anticipated in terms of incremental progress. Okay, that makes sense. I don't know, I guess maybe called out or something like that. I could just see that as, you know, that, that one, this one specifically different because the code's ahead of it versus the straight line down to 70% by 2030. All right. Okay, uh, Mike Kennedy, do you now have a yeah. question? So, Mike Fowler, how did your base levels compare? to the base levels in the legislative report. I mean, is this gonna be a problem every one of these cycles where a few of them drop below or something? Uh, potentially, if we make good progress on our code, yes. Um, there was never the intent for this to be having, having a path that somebody could do something easier. Um, I mean, the other piece of this is, is that it, there's a prescriptive piece of this where, um, all building, uh, if your building type is in this piece, I mean, all the walls, all walls have to be minimum R32. Uh, roofs are, I think, too high, but uh, uh, they're an R66. Um, you know, the wow. windows are more stringent than our code. Um, but um, question. I have to did, find, did, yeah. Did you submit a proposal to modify any of these? No, um, no, it was just to update the table to strike out the column of 2018 because it's no longer applicable. Um, I'm just sharing that uh, last week when you shared the table of progress for our codes, Chell, that, um, that I went down this week and compared them actually yesterday uh, and just saw that retail is the only one where the code has made more progress than, than the, okay. as, well, as a, how, as how a head of our to look at, look at any numbers on this table that you would like to revise based on um, based on that report that you saw last week. And then you can choose whether it's just retail or any others. Does that sound good? Uh, that sounds fine, yeah. And I'll, and I'll also peek at, uh, Mike Kennedy brought up a good point. I'm curious to see what, because there was never a 2006 uh, source, which is why I had to use information from best I could find it was 2003. So I'm um, okay. curious to peek at that one as well. Sounds good. And feel free to reach out to me and I can help you. Um, okay. Because I have looked at that data a lot. Okay, and, we'll do. Uh, others might as well offer their assistance. Okay, well, that gets us through all the editorials. Now we're on the tough ones. So, um, expanding scope to process equipment is the next one. Or, no, uh, yeah, yep. So, this is a 
Well, my hope is this is not expanding scope. Um, as much as I'd like to, that was not the intent of this proposal. Um, in the current code, this, except this, what is a new section here, 401.2.2, is an exception that exists in the mechanical chapter, C403. And it, it's saying that process equipment is exempt except for these sections. And it's, it's calling out sections like C410, C405, but the exception itself is in C403. So my intent was to bring it out so it's you know at a level that's commiserate with what its content is and basically say process equipment can get through the code by just complying with these sections. Um, so the intent was is not expansion, but just to clarify uh, the current exception. The exceptions are left in the chapter in C403. You can just see it on the screen now. Um, and then I've added a, a similar parallel exception to 404 and 405. Um, so that so that you know going through those codes it's still clear that only um 405.8 impacts process and only table c404.2 and section c404.2 impact process so i don't know it, it always bugged me to have an exception that was somehow involving other sections of code yeah inside <laughs> three. Lisa. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, thanks, Mike. I, I think this is a, a, a good change to the energy code. I, I would agree that you know, varying exceptions to other chapters of the code inside of the mechanical chapter is, is not ideal. And so by pulling this out and making it clear that uh, process systems, process equipment, you know, it make it clear that all these different provisions are the only ones that apply, I think is uh, a beneficial change. Okay. And um, anybody else have thoughts on this? Okay. Well, are there any more pieces to this, Mike, or is this the whole thing. Okay, you're on mute, by the way, but I see you looks. Um, yeah, there's two more exceptions that just basically are paralleling what's in 403. And I guess technically they're not needed, but um, I was trying to be thorough. I think when that, um, the exception in the mechanical chapter was added, um, the well motor C405.8 was in the mechanical chapter and as, as well as refrigeration. And but the goal was to also to have basically so someone coming in with process equipment could look at the list about what applies directly. It would just provide a pretty easy path for them. And I feel like that that's the intent is maintaining. <laughs> All right. Well, I don't see any more comments or questions. So I think everybody generally thinks this is a good path forward. Um, it clar clarifies things. All right. Well, we're about to get to the, the, the really easy one today. Um, take it away, Johnny. Hey there, everybody. Um, thanks for letting me uh, come today. Um, yeah. So this one here is uh, we're, we're talking about um, basically requiring uh, fossil fuel free uh, space heating. And uh, we figure that this is the best way for us to be able to get the 19% energy reductions um, for the uh, code that is needed in order to hit the 2030 goals. And um, also um, it's kind of copying what was done in Seattle and um, has been shown successfully to be able to be passed in Seattle. Um, Overall, it's um, in line with what the 2021 state energy strategy is stating that we need for um, heat pump uh, stock 
in sale percentages. Um, there's like, you know, we have to double it by 2030 and we're not gonna be able to get there unless we start electrifying. I'm happy to answer any questions. So my understanding from this, because I've, I've looked at it a little bit, is there's an exception for residential, and there's also um, uh, it does it apply to all building typologies or just a limited subset? This would apply to all. Okay, Gary. Get off mute. Um, so I'm going to speak. Uh, in opposition to this uh, particular proposal. Probably not a surprise, but I see um, a, a number of what I consider significant and serious issues here. Uh, first one being that uh, this would eliminate choice of some highly efficient and cost-effective gas options and would prescriptively mandate really only one choice uh, for heating systems, uh, being heat pumps. Um, it's going to add cost um, and be more expensive than other options. Um, and some of the exceptions allowed uh, would allow for electric resistance heating or backup. Um, and, and these would happen uh, most often during cold weather, very cold weather. Uh, when there's already a peak uh, demand on the uh, electric grid, uh, when the marginal electric generation would, would most certainly be fossil fuels and effectively increasing rather than decreasing emissions. It also allows for the use of electric resistance heating of, of makeup air for commercial kitchens, again, during very, very cold weather. It's going to drive up emissions, uh, drive up um, energy costs um, and increase uh, emissions. Um, uh, you know, uh, heat pumps are, are a good technology, uh, but they are not emissions free, uh, especially during cold weather um, when uh, there is uh, fossil fuel generation on the margin. Um, it also states that uh, this will significantly reduce emissions and and I guess I would like to see some uh, substantiation of that. I, I didn't see any in the submission. Um, and it really is in the statement, uh, only more cost effective if you add in the social cost of carbon. So there's, you know, there's some serious issues here, I believe, uh, with this proposal. And um, so those are my comments, uh, thanks. Thanks, Gary. Um... And I just want to clarify for everybody that I think that we are obviously not going voting on this one today. So like the other proposals, we are collecting the questions, concerns, and uh, suggestions for different code language um, today. So um, to Gary's point about cost effectiveness, we just to make it abundantly clear, we're not required to have the code be cost effective. It just needs to be the least cost path to reach our energy goals, in this case, probably a 19% reduction in this cycle. Um, so, so Johnny, I think, you know, taking notes on, on what Gary said about the challenges with this, and then especially if, um, if Gary, I, I see that you're kind of against the whole thing, um, but I'd love to have if you have any suggestions for how to make the, I mean, you, you could be against the whole thing and that's fine. But if there's suggestions for you know anything other than striking out the entire thing, um, I'd lo love to get those, especially from you. I will take another look at it, Kyle. But you know, first blush is is um, uh, opposing the entire thing. But I I will um, I will take a look at it and work with my colleagues to see if there's any way to improve on this. Uh, I, I don't have a whole lot of hope but, uh, about that from our perspective, but I appreciate it, Joe. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Could, could I respond to um, some of those comments? Please. Yes, um, on uh, cost effectiveness, I just wanted to correct that. Um, it is actually going to be cost effective um, through its life cycle cost without the social cost of carbon in all but one of the scenarios that we looked at. 
Um, so just wanted to correct that. There is one case in which um, it required the social cost of carbon in order to uh, be cost effective. And that was like in uh, one of the specific building types, which is the coastal, um, let's see here. I think it's the coastal office. Um, I'd have to look back, but yeah. Um, so because of the fact that I, I just wanted to like, you know, correct that part, part, uh, part. and then um, to Joe's point about, you know, it has to be the lowest cost in order to reach the uh, overall, you know, code. Um, the 2021 state energy strategy like, pointed out that building electrification and stopping install installation of fossil fuels in buildings is the cheapest way for us to reach our carbon goals um, for the state that are required. So um, we can continue to um, ignore that, but this is the, this is gonna be the cheapest pathway. And uh, when paired with electrification of water heating, um, there are a number of studies, all of which I've linked, that have showed that commercial buildings, um, as well as residential buildings, can be and are frequently cheaper than mixed fuel buildings because of the avoided natural gas infrastructure installed to the building, as well as the combination of space and cooling equipment that are combined together. You don't need to have a separate furnace and air conditioner. You can install them together and have one piece of equipment. Uh, okay. With, okay, I can keep going, but- Thanks, oh. thanks Johnny. I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll hear from a bunch of people and then if, if needed, you can respond to any of that. Um, so Chris Burroughs. All right, thank you. Um, so first I kind of want to, I want to uh, back up what Gary was saying. I, I pretty much agree with most, with, with, I agree with all of his comments. Um, one thing uh, as kind of the electric utility representative that I would say is concerning uh, from our point of view on this would be what happens on a cold February morning where all of this is over on, everything's running on electric resistance and you're getting massive peaks and um, everything we do is about reliability for our customers. And this makes it really a lot tougher to guarantee any kind of reliability to our customers when we're forcing ourselves into peak by having everybody on electric, on backup, electric resistance backup. Um, so that, that is, that's a, a very big concern in addition to the stuff that uh, Gary brought up. Thanks, Chris. Um, Mike Kennedy. Yeah, I guess I was curious, Johnny, how, how many, um, I guess, how well has this language been vetted from a technology perspective? I mean, do we need to be dotting the I's on all these details? Um, I haven't read through it super close, but um, there's a lot of details in here. Yeah, I, I mean, this is, um, sorry, should I respond to that, Joe, or should I collect, should we collect all the comments? Yep, yep. So the question is how technically feasible is it? And, and I'm just gonna respond quickly that we want, that's why we have a tag is to make sure that all code proposals that we generally are in favor of are extremely feasible um, when the code goes into effect in, in uh, July 1, 2023. So I think that's a really good question. And I, I, I'm hoping that we can dive into the details of what makes this feasible or not feasible and that we can get specific comments on the proposal about that. And um, yes, this is, this is very similar to Seattle's um, proposal. Yeah. So, so it's considered in King County um, and 43 cities in California have already passed similar. So this is not out of the blue. Yeah. Mike, did you have another comment or question on Mike Kennedy? Okay, Patrick. Well, I'm just looking at all the numbers and for someone that probably sizes thousands of wall heaters and equipment per year, thousands of, these numbers are really low. And so 
I would be suspect, you know, you just can't take arbitrary things and say maximum of a thousand watts in a corner unit. I mean, that's just not how equipment sizing works. And um, you can't do something like this. I understand the concept, but you can't throw numbers at it. It's the envelope of the building that dictates the equipment sizing. And so I'm gonna follow along with Gary and say, I don't really wanna wholesale reject it, but I agree with Mike Kennedy that these numbers need to be verified and, and maybe removed. Um, you, there's just no, put your thumb out and go 1300 watts in zone five. I mean, that's not how it works. Well, I mean, the, the, the person applying for a permit also controls the envelope. So they go hand in hand. Shall yeah, so one could reasonably improve the envelope to get to this level or not. But if you have um, information on sizing thousands of these systems, um, it'd be great to have that specific feedback on what is what is a reasonable number or a reasonable code way. I will, I will put limiting, something- To Gary's point, uh, to Gary's point it, limiting electric resistance. Um, I, I will put something together because my program takes, it has everything in it in BTUs per hour, DHL, maximum, it's all in BTUs per hour and it's in watts and it is in average also per square foot. Okay, that sounds great. Yeah, please put some. I'll put something together and uh, send it to Krista. That sounds great. Yeah, I think. What is this proposal number? Scroll up so I can address the right one. This is uh, 103. 21 GP1 103. And I have one more quick question. Johnny, who do you represent? It's a great question. Um, I work for uh, Rocky Mountain Institute and I'm a part of the Shift Zero Coalition. So are you, do you actually do the things I just talked about? You know, actually size equipment and do these sort of things? I'm a registered mechanical engineer and I have over five years experience doing design. All right, just just curious, because I live and eat, eat this and breathe this stuff all day long. No, I don't think we make any minimum requirements for people proposing uh, oh, I was just changes. curious, because I was after the uh, level of accuracy, Shell. Yep, um, yeah, okay. Um, I think Amy had her hand up next. Or, no, sorry, sorry. Um, I think someone named Chris that doesn't have a last name on there was next. Chris, without a last name, can you introduce yourself? Yep, yeah, there we go. Uh, hi, my name is Chris Holliday. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer and also okay. a uh, HVAC contractor here over in the Spokane area. Um, and yeah, I'd like to kind of back up Gary as well. Um, I understand that this that some of these regulations work great, uh, potentially over on the west side where you're not seeing those extreme cold temperatures. But um, you got a couple of issues that I'm mostly concerned about is number one, um, in order to keep us off of the electric backup resistance, you're talking about very high efficiency heat pumps, um, as well as I'm concerned if there's even, and I'm glad we've got a utility on board here, is there even the infrastructure to be able to handle a kind of regulation like this? That's really my biggest concern. And I know Spokane is, city of Spokane is looking at doing something like this too. And I just not really sure from a cost standpoint to the end user uh, requiring such high efficient equipment um, as well as just the in infrastructure in general to be able to handle so much electric resistance um, to uh, to back up those heat pumps. Thanks, Chris. I guess um, so. You're concerned about the uh, the electric resistance at the kind of de defrost time, right? Right. Or you know, you get to a threshold uh, with certain efficiency heat pumps that they just can't. There's no more energy to suck out of the air, 
um, with their HSPF to be able to um, effectively heat the uh, facility, whether, whether it's commercial or residential setting. And so they can actually um, go directly to uh, the backup heat source, you know, electric resistance heat to effectively heat the, the, um, the space. Yeah, how, how um, what are the lowest temperatures that you see heat pumps working we, at? So the, the minimum efficiency heat pump these days is 14 sear. And you know those those really start be, uh, becoming useless around 30 degrees, at least over here in the Spokane area. Um, you know, yes, there is 20 sear heat pumps, the higher end stuff. I'm talking about unitary equipment here um, that can go down to you know as low as zero degrees before they really start needing backup heat. But from a cost standpoint on those products, you're really uh, force, you know, you're really forcing the issue of the upfront costs on that equipment. And I don't know that that's being, um, accounted for a what as well. Okay. Um, okay. Um, we'll just keep going around and, and I think this is worth lots of conversation. It is now 1130 and we're going to take a break at this time, but this is an, a, a good conversation. So let's, should we keep going for a few more minutes? Um, Amy? Now you're putting me between uh, folks and lunch. Um, but I guess overall, I, I generally su I support the direction of this proposal. I mean, all of the studies indicate that we're going to need to, you know, begin building all electric buildings. And we have the technology now, it seems reasonable. Um, I, I hear the concerns about um, electric reliability. I, I also haven't seen them necessarily. Um, I hear a lot of words around it, around it. I'm not seeing necessarily the data about it. Um, I know, I think Johnny, you, you had some backup information about just current proposals or current projects underway with these technologies. Um, so I, I, I just sense that the market is already heading in this direction and that we should be you know, providing some more, um, more information to support it. Um, so including in, on the east side of the state. So. Um, I'll, I'll stop there, but you know, generally, I think this is a good direction for our code to be going to to meet our energy reduction goals, but also just to be um, moving in the direction of our overall state policy. Thanks, Amy. Um, Lisa, I thank you. Um, I'll, uh, I'll I'll second Amy's comments in that uh, th this is definitely heading in the direction that the state of Washington has been stating as the, the goal, which is to move away from fossil fuels. So I'll say that as a general statement. And then I just have one specific uh, detail in the whole, uh, the exception for specific conditions uh, where it says, uh, where it, it, it basically relies on uh, a code official's interpretation or a code official's um, call on this one. And so I just I, I understand the purpose of the exception. I think that it is, is needed to have that kind of an exception. Um, however, this, this does put a lot of burden on the jurisdictional community. So I would be interested in hearing uh, some thoughts from the jurisdictional community about that particular exception. Okay, that's good. Um, when we can, we can, we can ask those in the jurisdictions about that. Um, I am, I guess, anticipating at this point that there we could, we could, we will talk about this for a long time. So, I think we should take a break um, so that we can get lunch and, and bio break and all that stuff. So, why don't we take a break? Um, we can keep it to twenty minutes if that's um, twenty minutes. Maybe stretch. Heat up your lunch. So why don't we meet back here at uh, noon? Does that sound good? And then um, those of you with your hands up, keep them up. And then when you come back, uh, when we come back, you will. I will call on you first. All right. See you all shortly.
Can't hear you, Joe. Kelly, <laughs> you're muted. Thank you. Um, welcome back. It's the noon hour, and um, come back with us. Um, we're going to continue talking about this proposal for heat pump space heating. Um, I did some thinking about how to organize our comments, and we've had several comments that are blanket statements for and blanket statements against. And I guess I don't see a path from where we are now to the year 2030 or even the 2021 code that we are required to write that doesn't involve increasing the number of heat pumps in buildings. Um, I don't think there's a way to get the 19% energy reduction without increasing heat pumps in water heating, space heating, or both. I don't think we can just do it with envelope and you know, uh, gas and electric, electric resistance are both, you know, have a, a theoretical efficiency of, of less than 100%. So in heat pumps tend to be two to three to, or more times more efficient. So I don't see a way to get there without heat pumps. So I would really appreciate is if you want to state if you oppose it or, or no one oppose it in a blanket way, but then provide feedback on how we could make the proposal such that you would be, that it would align with, with your values and your goals and your technical feasibility understanding um, as opposed to just, just making a blanket statement. Um, so, you know, today we're just collecting comments and questions and concerns about this. So um, we're writing them down and Johnny's writing them down. Um, so, so on that note, please, please provide the technical feasibility feedback, and um, um, and with that, we'll go back to those who um, had their hands up uh, at the end of the last session. So, um, I wrote down that Sean, Rob, and Eric had their hands up um, at the end, and we'll get to other people in that order. So, Sean. Uh, this is Amy. It looks like Sean had to drop off. I was, should I read his comment in the chat um, for the Oh, rest? yeah, sure. Yep. Um, Sean says, uh, I had to drop off, but wanted to add one consideration. This is the direction the state needs to move. It is not possible to go this far because uh, electric resistance backup or capacity concerns make this unworkable. Washington should, should consider a hybrid approach. Denver is moving forward par toward partial electrification strategies to deal with these issues. They are currently considering slash developing strategies that would move the bulk of space heating during more temperate periods to heat pumps and allowing natural gas to be used as a backup instead of electric resistance. The same approach of using outdoor temperature thresholds could be applied to natural gas backup instead of electric resistance backup. This addresses the winter peak and operating cost issues, even if it means losing some of the long-term decarbonization potential of going toward full electrification now. If the tag feels that the barriers are insurmountable in this code cycle, it would be better to see partial electrification requirements in the Washington code. Okay, thank you, Amy. Um, I was, I had to leave the meeting, uh, so I didn't get that chat. Um, could you send that text to me, Amy? Sure, I'll recopy it. And... Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, next person was Rob. Rob Marks. Yeah, hello, Rob Marks, uh, energy efficiency engineer for Snohomish PUD number one survey in all of Snohomish County and Camino Island. Uh, we've had a broad heat pump adoption program in our energy efficiency. And the last couple of summers, we have started to see summer peak uh, loads show up as well. We've always been a winter peaking utility in our we are somewhat concerned about um, where we go to 100% electrical loads for the heating and water heating um, future loads. I want to stress there should be some way that we cannot eliminate uh, the future technologies that can be developed with still using our natural gas uh, pipeline and network with potentials for hydrogen and other renewable natural gas type products. So it's, it's a huge battery bank and infrastructure that's already built. And I think I'm concerned personally that uh, we're gonna make our Washington state, at least Western Washington, um, not an economically feasible place to live or work if we go too far down this path. But let's not cut ourselves off at the knees with uh, 
by going to an all electric mandate right away. That's all. Okay, and okay, do you have any specific comments on the proposal that would make it align better with your um, I mean, the legislature has given us the direction to hit the 70% energy reduction, and we we are not lobbying the legislature to change that today. So I guess, how do we get from here to there? And what would make this proposal more in line with how you think we should get from here to there? Um, let me take a look at it. I, okay. I'm going to have to put it back to a part of our team and see if they have any ideas. Okay, that's great. And, um, and, and that's a question I'm asking everybody. Um, okay. is how do we get from here there, if not this, and um, what are the specific comments you can make on this that would make it um, in line with getting to our goals? Um, let's see, Eric Bedell. Hello, uh, I'm Eric Bedell. I, I'm GLY's mechanical specialist. GLY is a, a general contractor in the Puget Sound. Um, so, you know, Chell, you you started off with a with a great um, just started off the meeting with with the increments, right? We have to meet certain increments, and right now I'm to, I'm undecided on which way I'm going to vote on this because I do want to understand by the mechanical engineers or even the air source heat pump suppliers on how low do the uh, air source heat pumps operate to? Is it 20 degrees, 30 degrees? And, you know, what works for temperate climates in like the Puget Sound area potentially doesn't work for Eastern Washington. I mean, where it gets much colder. And as multiple people has already said, uh, you know, we're going to need some, we're going to need electric resistance to pick up that, that bandwidth from, you know, whatever that is, 30 degrees to zero degrees, which puts additional strain on the, the uh, electrical grid. Um, so, you know, Shell, you asked on how, how can we, you know, what solutions, and, and maybe it's it's climate zones, you know, in some climate zones where it's tempered, where air source heat pumps work without putting this electrical resistance on there, maybe it's, maybe it's moving towards that and making it, it mandatory there or places in eastern Washington where it gets really cold. Um, maybe there's some other solutions. Uh, you know, someone represented that uh, maybe furnaces could be used as backup. You know, it's an air source heat pump in, in conjunction with, with furnaces. So again, I, I'm, this is this is near and dear to me. Um, I'm, I'm open uh, and I, I'd love to hear everyone's solutions. That's it. Thanks, Eric. It doesn't tell me the order of people raising their hands, but I'm going to go with uh, Scott Peterson. Uh, hey, this is Scott Peterson. I work with uh, the Northwest Gas Association. Uh, we obviously have concerns about about this proposal, and um, I probably have 20 concerns with it, but I'll just focus on the fact that this seems premature to us uh, to begin eliminating uh, natural gas as a uh, in natural gas appliances uh, in new construction. Uh, for starters, if the goal is decarbonization, I mean, there's the efficiency goal, and I'm not ignoring that. Uh, if the goal is decarbonization, electrification is not the only path to decarbonization. As a matter of fact, the, the gas industry is beginning to decarbonize the pipeline system with renewable natural gas that is in some cases carbon, or in many cases, most cases carbon negative. Uh, <clears throat> and they're beginning to add hydrogen uh, to the system slowly. And we're at the very beginning of that. So to uh, prematurely preclude these appliances before the industry has a chance to fully decarbonize uh, seem you're denying this choice prematurely. As far as efficiency, I know, and I don't have a specific answer except to say the industry is increasing the efficiency of its equipment. And, um, and, and much like with electrification, 
all the technology is not there. We don't even know if there's going to be enough electricity to and and a, a grid to support proposals like this. And so electrification is being given a benefit of the doubt that we're also asking for. Uh, so we have time to increase the efficient, the industry has time to increase the efficiency of its equipment as well as decarbonize its system. And um, as, as has been mentioned before, we have this built system um, that is ready to be deployed. So if, you know, I think um, if changes are gonna be made, they need to be made in a way that allow for the installation uh, of equipment that can burn renewable natural gas and hydrogen and and other changes that the industry is making. Okay, Scott, I'm gonna, so your answer to if not this, what your answer is that uh, <clears throat> the gas industry is decarbonizing the, 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 the fossil gas grid and actually, you know, this, this proposal doesn't say anything about renewable natural gas. It just talks about fossil fuel fired uh, heating equipment. So to the extent that the, grid, the, uh, not the uh, fossil gas grid will be decarbonized, this proposal says nothing about that. Um, and then I just have a question about the highest I've ever seen, the most aspirational I've ever seen is that the gas industry has proposed that maybe five or eight, maybe 10% uh, of, the, of the gas used in the state could be considered renewable. Um, I'd love to see anything, including costs uh, that go beyond that because what the, what the state found was that it would cost more for the, <clears throat> for the gas grid to go uh, renewable than for the electricity grid to go renewable. And the, so that's, that's the, the basis I'm starting from. Um, right. and if, we, if you have so, studies, I'd love to see them. I mean, when they were submitted to the Department of Commerce for the state energy strategy and they were ignored, we question many of the assumptions used in that, those cost projections. And I frankly, question the assumptions in this proposal at the end on cost projections. Uh, so there needs to be, uh, you know, a lot more consideration of the available data that was has been ignored by the policy making to date. So, we, so that's, so yeah, we'd love to submit that information and, and we can. The, uh, and I agree with you that it only addresses fossil fuel, but the way that this will be implemented in practice is, you know, by by folks building homes and commercial buildings is to preclude uh, natural gas burning appliances. And so uh, that'll be the practical application of this rule. And so there needs to be something that allows uh, that that understands the decarbonization efforts of the natural gas grid. Okay, so the we have ten years to get to a fossil fuel free uh, buildings industry. Um, so that can be done with electrification. It could also be done if there's a nine-year plan for the decarbonization of the natural gas grid. Um, so I'd love to see that plan. Um, and if there is no such plan, then um, we can't meet our state mandates unless, without going with electrification. I mean, that, that's, that's the way I read the law. And um, so please show me the plan that shows in nine years that we can have a 100% renewable uh, gas grid. <coughs> if not, what we need to do now is start transitioning the industry, um, you know, to install the equipment that's going to be required in the year 2030. Um, so we need to take steps, you know, 19% every code cycle between now and then. So 
Um, I understand that we're we're just looking for the for I guess we'll 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 submit the additional information that helps inform this conversation. I guess. Sure. Yeah, I think more information is good. So yeah, please. Uh, okay. Um, uh, Alexander, rock that. Thanks, Chef. Um, just have a small comment uh, related to some of the discussion prior, but for a variety of these heat pumps, they're getting more efficient and able to operate down to lower temperatures. You can buy low ambient kits for some of the more straightforward R410 or other uh, refrigerant based um, units, but more appropriately, there are alternative refrigerant products that can operate down to negative 20 or negative 30 degrees. So I appreciate the worry on the east side of temperatures being too low to be able to extract heat from the air. But what we're seeing from a product perspective is that they're designing pieces of equipment that can operate down to those lower temperatures. That's great feedback. That's That was a data point that was kind of missing from this conversation. So it's great to hear that. Um, for those of you who have spoken, if you want to take your hand down when you're done speaking. Um, Eric Bedell, did you still have a question, comment? Okay, and same with um, Scott Peterson. Okay, um, Lisa, I don't think we've heard from you. Yeah, uh, just a, another yeah. quick comment. <clears throat> One detail that kind of comes to mind, particularly with regards to the language that points to climate zones and uh and to in response to the comments from folks on the east side who are making you know good points there um I, i'm wondering if this needs to be more granular than just the two climate zones uh because there are areas of the state where it's particularly climate zone, which is now, it's all climate zone five, but- you know, Hey Lisa, can I break in for just a second? Yeah. So the law says we can only have two climate zones. Um, Got it. <clears throat> okay. It's um, unfortunate, but but that's what the law says. So um, yeah. I th okay. there could be a different approach based on like heating degree days or, or I don't know, some other thing. Um, yeah, yeah that, that was the direction I was, my thoughts going and I apologize, it's not a fully baked thought here, um, but the, just thinking back to you know what is required to size these systems, um, breaking it up with just these limits that are based on climate zone four, climate zone five, uh, I would agree with some of the comments that that really doesn't address uh, very very specific zonal areas and their needs. And so again, I, I don't know how that would look. I understand what the state limitation is, so maybe degree days or something like that. But that's just, it's just a thought to toss into the pile. But more granularity perhaps might be um, helpful. Thanks, that's, that's good, good feedback. Um, Gary Heikkinen. Yeah, thanks, Chell. Um, I guess a couple of things. Um, the, um, I do believe we can get to the 70% reduction, uh, and the law does state 70% reduction by 2031. And I do believe that we can get there by still utilizing the gas system. Uh, as people have mentioned before, the advent of renewable natural gas and hydrogen, although nascent, uh, is happening. Um, and the percentages will be much higher than the 5 8% um, that you have stated. Um, um, that's one thing. Uh, number two, uh, the electric system. Well, Gary, control. just what is the percentage that, that you're working with for? I, don't well, know. I, can, I, I can speak from Northwest Naturals uh, perspective in terms of the goal uh, to be in the range of 30% by 2030. Now, by which year? Um, I'm sorry, I better clarify that. Sorry, 30% um, by miss, what year? Um, I need to clarify if that's a 2030 number or if that's like a 2040 number. 
apologize for that. Okay, no but worries. Much We're higher, going to discuss this again. So. Okay, much higher than the five to eight uh, percent. Number two, the electric system will not be decarbonized um, um, by 2030. Uh, it does stay carbon neutral, yes, but won't be fully decarbonized per the law until 2045. Um, the law does not use the statement fossil fuel free. It certainly states um, that the energy code um, um, is to construct increasingly energy efficient homes that help achieve the broader goal of building zero fossil fuel greenhouse gas emissions homes and industries by 2031. And again, doesn't say anything about eliminating natural gas or fossil gas. And, and finally, um, there are some gas heat pump technologies uh, already on the market and more being developed. So again, eliminating uh, this choice at this point in time is premature. Uh, and if we're gonna you know, look at decarbonizing um, uh, we need to be um, the, the goal of decarbonizing all energy systems. Um, and there are commitments, I think, by the gas utilities uh, to have a decarbonized or, or carbon neutral systems uh, by 2040 or 2050. So um, again, um, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the crux of my statements. And I, I appreciate your attention. Thanks, Gary. Um, Chris Burroughs. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Um, so just to add, to try to add stuff instead of repeating what's already been said. Um, first thing for the uh, PSE, we're aspiring to be net, uh, net zero carbon gas by 2045. And that's a combination of multiple areas. That's first, it's increasing RNG. It's putting in, um, uh, putting in hydrogen in our system, which right now the technological limits of hydrogen are about 7%, but there are investments you can make to increase that above uh, the percent of hydrogen in the, in the fuel lines. Um, and then we have, uh, so, and then the other way that we get there is by reducing overall gas sales and targeting where gas fits best in our system and, and looking forward. Um, so what I'm going to leave you guys with is I'm going to throw in the, in the chat, there's a link to our like 2045 net zero plan for a Puget Sound Energy. It's pretty unique. It's different than anything I've ever seen. It's not uh, like the standard trying to put lipstick on a pig of a, of a gas company. There's some real things in here uh, that will help meet our carbon uh, goals. So if you guys could kind of maybe read through it and kind of just let it maybe inform you a little bit as we go through these discussions, I think it would be a, a benefit for everybody here. Thanks, Chris. Um... So 2045 net zero carbon gas. And I guess, where does the hydrogen come from? What's created? So injected into our system. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. I, I can go ask that question where we're getting the hydrogen from, but um, it's apparently be, it's being counted as a, a non-fossil fuel portion or, or an RNG portion of the natural gas. Okay, yeah, I know you can make natural gas with electric, or uh, you can make uh, hydrogen using electricity, um, but yeah. I, I'm not sure where, where it's coming from. So I'll, I'll look at, look at that. Yeah, check, check that out. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Charles. Um, and I guess that's a good segue into what I was going to say, Chris. Um, you know, I don't think we're, we're advocating for the end of the gas system. There are thousands of buildings all over the state currently connected to the gas system. It's like, you know, what is the, the highest and best use of, of those limited gas resources if you're trying to constrict them and of those um, limited RNG and hydrogen resources as we're deploying them. Um, the Northwest Energy Coalition is, um, we're, you know, very open to alternative fuels. It's just like, where does it make the most sense to deploy them as we're developing them? Um, in the last legislative session, the clean fuel standard passed. And I think that is really going to be where, at least in the, the near term, a lot of RNG resources are going to be focused uh, because that is going to be a developing market. Um, so I, you know, when I think about what the highest and best resource uh, use of RNG is, it's not in new construction. Um, and new construction is like, how can we make those buildings the most efficient and make the best use of um, electricity resources? Um, 
and then a separate topic. Uh, Alexander, you mentioned some examples of, of cold temperature um, heat pumps that might make sense in Eastern Washington. I just wonder if we could get more information for the TAG to, to learn more about those so we're all informed. So, uh, the one specifically I was referencing, we've used for hot water heating, so not for um, space heating within Eastern Washington, would be the Sandin CO2 based heat pump that can operate down to negative 20. And then with low ambient kits, um, even in Seattle, we can get split systems that operate down to negative five, or sorry, not negative five, positive five. Great. There's a lot of information about, about configurations of heat pumps uh, from the AWHI on, and on the ECTOP website and NIA website, but CO2 is the one that goes down the lowest temp. And, you know, there's only one or two of those on the mark. There's more on the way. Mike Kennedy. Yeah. Um, just current current heat pump technology. Um, any all the inverter driven heat pumps, which are, are getting to be a larger and larger piece of the technology pie, they have no problems running down usually to below zero. Um, in the original ductless heat pump stuff, um, units were running in Montana um, just fine, just standard units, not even cold, quote unquote cold climate units. So, I, I mean, I think there's some research to do here, but it's not as dire as um, they don't work in Eastern Washington. There's actually quite a nexus of heat pumps in, in Eastern Washington. Um, taking advantage of the uh, relatively cheaper electric rates in some of the counties out there. Um, I've even seen a hospital using primarily heat pumps. So. Thanks, Mike. Okay, well, I don't think we have exhausted the possibilities of discussing this, but most of you have shied away from suggesting different code language. Um, perhaps, perhaps limiting the number of typologies or um, increasing the electric resistance uh, allowances or, or suggesting other changes within this. So I urge you all, this is, this is one of only a few proposals that can get us to 19%. Um, so I urge you to take a hard look at this and get facts and come for our next discussion on this, which will probably be in a few weeks with, with facts and um, verified studies and other things that can provide a basis for this. Um, <clears throat> I, think, I think if we can lead with facts, we can make pretty good decisions. You know, For instance, knowing <laughs> what kind of heat pumps go down, how far, I think there were some questions to utilities um, and Irina and um, Chris uh, on electrical capacity and how that is going to be built out under the, the laws that are currently um, in place and whether um, there is a, you know, gonna be a lack of capacity based on this, um, the, the legislative mandates that we're going to follow. I think that's, that's, those are a couple of questions. I think seeing more about what the gas industry is going to do um, or, or could do and the costs of it and the, the logistics of that. Um, I think seeing, I think it'd be good to get a couple of project teams that have actually built heat pump based um, projects to talk about how they're operating in real life, and especially on the east side. Um, I think all that would provide facts that we can then you know, discuss the merits of this. But, but I urge you to, to take a hard look at this and see if you can propose, propose actually different code language that would, <clears throat> that would make it more, uh, more feasible if you think it's, it's infeasible. Um, I, I really, really don't want to get into, I like it, I don't like it um, kind of strategies because I think this, this is only one of our few ways forward and um, we, need to, we need to increase the number of heat pumps, certainly. And whether they're electric heat pumps or gas heat pumps, that's certainly something that can be proposed. Um, 
lots of other things can be proposed. So let's 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 look at that and let's let's um, let's try and entertain some some better language that would make this uh, a good proposal that can get us towards our nineteen percent energy reduction. I guess with that, Mike, do you have any more thoughts? You have your hand up. Probably don't mean to have your hand up. Um, okay, okay so real anymore? quick, could you, yeah, yeah just real quick, uh, could we get a, a schedule of when that would happen? Because I probably have some contractors that I'd want to bring in to talk to, talk to everybody about what they're seeing with these folks. Or how, I guess, how far in advance will we know when we'll talk about this again? Let's see. Krista, do you remember you sent something out? I'm, I'm looking it up now as well. Trying to remember. I don't think I printed it out. So we, yeah, we. Just, a, just knowing as soon as possible. It doesn't have to be right this second, but yeah. Yeah, I think I think we'll send out. Um, Chris and I work together and send out a schedule of when we think all the other ones are going to be considered. And this is kind of an initial reading. Um, it will not be next week because we have a building code council, um, and I don't think it will be the following week either, the twenty fifth. Um, but on the twenty fifth, I think we will talk about heat pump water heating, which is in some ways a similar topic. All right, well, uh, thank you all for that. Let's, let's move on to the next, the next uh, code proposal. Which is kitchen demand control ventilation with Nick and Neil. Hey there, can you hear me, Joe? Yep. Great. Yeah, so this this is just kind of a reorg of this section for um, kitchen demand control ventilation. Um, it's similar to the other DCV section. It's a little confusing on um, sort of a list of requirements and options, and then a bunch of exceptions that can at sometimes seem to contradict um, what was up above. So this is a uh, an attempt to reorganize this and move the primary focus of um, kitchen exhaust to demand control ventilation in the charging language and then allow exceptions for other types down below rather than provide a list of options up above. So the energy savings piece of this is, is requiring the energy recovery? Um, well, it requires demand control ventilation. So the, the way it was written originally was that if it's got a airflow of greater than 2000 CFM and had to comply with one of the following, uh, DCB was one of the requirements, a 50% uh, of transfer air or replacement air being transfer air or having heat recovery um, were three of the options that you could use to comply with. And then there was a bunch of exceptions if you, you know, met that threshold, but, uh, but didn't want to comply with one of these. So what we're saying now is that you know, by and large, these exhaust hoods chose the DCV path. Um, talking to some some contractors, they have yet to see an energy recovery device on a kitchen exhaust system. So it kind of moves those exceptions down down below. So you can see the <clears throat> the new exception four down there is actually just the language from up above um, okay. as, as a minimum requirement. But it's, it's basically just shifting it to say provide DCV on hoods at 2000 CFM or greater unless you have one of these conditions um, okay. down below. Okay, Lisa. Hi, yeah, just uh, one a comment with regards to terminology. Um, so for kitchen exhaust hoods, there, the system is, is not at what is defined as demand controlled ventilation. Um, it, it is called a demand ventilation system, a little different than what we think of for demand controlled ventilation. So the proposal would need to address that detail. You're talking about a, a demand kitchen, sorry, kind of cut out there when you were saying, but demand kitchen control ventilation, is that what you said? No, the, um, the actual control technology that kitchen hoods you know, as, a, as an option that can be chosen 
for a uh, kitchen exhaust hood, I mean, that is what the demand ventilation system option in that list was. Mm -hmm. And so I guess what I'm asking is, is, is this, is this requiring demand controlled ventilation based on like the way that is defined in the energy code for spaces or, or are we about a, the demand ventilation um, technology that can be selected as an option with a kitchen hood? Right, I think the intent is the latter there. It's essentially, you know, smoke detectors within the hood and things like that that are, that are triggering the, the demand control ventilation within that system, not the larger uh, general de demand control ventilation that we have elsewhere. Got it, okay. Then as a friendly amendment, what I would recommend is that the terminology be revised so that it doesn't say demand controlled ventilation, but it, it um, refers to demand, uh, demand ventilation control or you know what, whatever mm -hmm. the, the hood technology um, uses for that. Um, or wh whatever the hood um, industry uses for that technology. And it would also be very beneficial because it's not been in the code to have some kind of um, clarification on exactly what that is. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that. We can change it to the terminology that's that's more common with the, the hood manufacturers. Um, so I'm happy right. to just revise that and have that uh, match up more succinctly. And then I think, Lisa, you're also suggesting adding a definition of that for that. Possibly, I, I, I would like to hear feedback from the rest of the group on whether they get, think that's necessary or not. Um, but it is a, a detail that when this provision was first put in the energy code, uh, we got a lot of questions from folks who didn't understand what that meant. And so we had to educate ourselves about hood technology and figure out, okay, well, what, what, what is it exactly? Um, so it would be good to have something in there that made it really clear um, what we're talking about, which is that it's a, it's a, a very hood specific uh, technology. Mike Kennedy. Yeah, I was gonna suggest adding the word hood to it, hood demand control or something, but I, I agree with Lisa that that is confusing to have two demand DCV mean two different things. So where would the word hood go? Maybe it's the first word. Hood demand control ventilation. Yeah, because the, the, the bolded kitchen exhaust hood system is not, titles are not part of the code. So even if it says hood in the, in the title of the section, that doesn't mean yeah. that everything in the section is about hoods yeah. necessarily. Hood sink, kitchen exhaust hood <laughs> system. Yeah, actually, yeah. if you, if you look at like the IntelliLink and, and MeLink that make a lot of these systems, they, they do call them demand control kitchen ventilation systems. So if you had hood and kitchen in there, hopefully it's a little bit more um, direct. Yeah. How about Robbie? Yeah, so uh, I just want to question the language on exception one, um, that last bit you've added about not otherwise being exhausted by DOAS energy recovery requirements. I mean, that's, I'm just picturing if you've got a, the way this normally was interpreted was like you've got a big dining area and you have to ventilate that dining area for the code, you would have a good source of replacement air for that system um, that would otherwise have been exhausted. So if you're saying if that dining area is served by a DOAS, then that doesn't count. I mean, I feel like this would, make that exception one very difficult to pursue in a lot of buildings. And I'm wondering trying if that's to, intent. I'm, no, I'm, I'm just trying to understand, sorry. I, what the, so the concern is that if you if you have a DOAS using the dining area and it's transferring that air into the kitchen for the, for the exhaust that um, if it's a large, you know, this is 75% or more, but if a, a large volume of that air is being used for transfer air, you're saying you would be able to meet this or not meet this exception? I mean, the way I, the way I read that, uh, the added language you added at the end is that I can't count air that's, that would have been exhausted through a DOAS. Like I assume you, you said that because the DOAS would have energy recovery and thus it's 
like you're, you're depriving the dough ass of the air. But I mean, if you've got a kitchen system, it's, it needs makeup air regardless. So that air is coming from somewhere. Right. Um, I guess, yeah. So some of the clarifying part of this is that um, it's, it's a large percentage of air, right? 75% or more um, would have to be provided by that. And also we, we had it at a minimum flow to make sure that it's, you know, if you've got pressurization issues or things of that nature, um, you would be able to meet this exception. So, so essentially you would not, you know, you could show that if you needed to have a minimum flow requirement for the kitchen hood, um, and that uh, was less than 75%, then, then you would, then you would have to meet this requirement. But if it was more of the, more than that, then you would, you would be able to take this exception. Is that, is that tracking with, with what, you're, what you're saying? I, I, I get what you're saying about the first part, like the first couple edits you made, but that last, mm -hmm. that last sentence seems like it, the, I don't know if it's intentional or not, but it seems like it would make this exception very rarely used. Because you're basically saying the DOAS air was already going to get exhausted, but it was going to go through an energy recovery device, and thus it's not valuable to use that as replacement air instead. Yeah, I mean, I th I'll have to think about this. I, I th you're correct that the intent there was to not rob the, you know, if you were using it for energy recovery, then um, then that's fine. But if but if you weren't, then then you need to be able to, um, you, and you're transferring that amount of air, then you need to provide this this demand control ventilation system. Uh, let me let me take a look at that, and I'll. Yeah, I'd, I'd appreciate it if you could could maybe see if that could be worded a little differently. Sure. Um, because I mean, I agree. I I've done a couple of kitchens, and it is often an option to do the replacement air. So even though these demand control ventilation systems usually pay back really quickly, they like they should be in the code. Um, but that ex what wasn't really an exception before that path one um, from the previous code often would let you get away without it. Mm -hmm. So having this clause might be an addition, a good addition. I think it would lead to more demand control ventilation systems, which is good. Um, I just as long as that's the intent, uh, I think maybe the language could be cleaned up a little bit. Okay, Lisa. Yeah, uh, two two comments. Um, I, I I would agree that I I think that uh, pushing to more of this uh, uh, hoods with this this type of um, energy saving technology is it, a good thing. Um, and the only other question I have is. Uh, have we heard from a representative of the you know kitchen design industry or contractors in particular who install these that you know do they have any feedback about this i i haven't heard many kitchen ventilation manufacturers this came from a design firm um as a suggestion for the for the edit and and for the most part this is really just cleaning up existing language that's in there i mean it's you always had to pick one of those options. Energy recovery was one of them. DCV was one of them. So now we're just saying DCV unless you can meet one of these exceptions. Um, and I agree if we add this last bit on exception one, it does uh, potentially tighten it. So we'll, we'll take a look at that. But, um, but I haven't heard from them from manufacturers directly okay. on any of this. All right, thank you. I mean, th this is in my experience, just working with some of the kitchen consultants, they've you know, we've had to add this late into a project because the it was determined that the, the client wanted it. And it was a very simple ad from their perspective. It's just controls and um, and dampers on some of the systems. Uh, and in, in that particular project, they already had the dampers. So it was just about adding the controls. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And also my uh, our understanding is that the uh, it, it's something that has been uh, there's more options. There's more product um, manufacturers that that offer this, uh, so it, it's well covered. I would agree. Hey, Chris Burrows. Yeah, I was just I was just going to add real quick. Um, 
I've sent this off to our program manager who runs our our D, DCKB rebate program, and she's uh, involved with manufacturers and, and distributors. So um, she may have some additional comments to be able to enlighten us more on the subject, and I'll let everybody know. That sounds good. That'd be great. And just to that, Chris, um, nobody can email the entire tag at once. That's just a that's considered a, a violation of the open meeting protocol. But you can send things to Krista if you want them distributed or or if you have any questions about distributing things. And I heard you say DC, DCKV as an acronym. And I think that's Krista's question is, is DCKV a thing? And if it is, then do we put it in the code as DCKV? Wait, I, I it mean, definitely is in the industry. Yeah, and that's what we call our rebate program, DC, DCKV. And we like ac acronyms at the utility, so. <laughs> yeah. So should demand control kitchen ventilation be capitalized? That seems weird. That doesn't seem very code like. Do we do that anywhere else in the code? And I'll, I'll toss in there too. I, I'm not sure if putting the word could at the beginning actually helps or hurts. As soon as you say DCKV, that's a known term in the industry that kind of stands alone is that that is a very specific technology associated with hoods. So uh, it might be that you don't need to put the word hood at the beginning. Okay, that's great. I think this is great feedback to, to make it a better proposal. Eric Vandermey, I, I miss you, seeing you in the code council meetings. And I'm sure you miss all those code council meetings. I guess my, my comment would be it should repeat kitchen exhaust hood system somewhere. So it, that's where you're putting the demand control kitchen ventilation controls at, right? So um, it's at the kitchen hoods. So to me, it should say something like kitchen exhaust hood system shall be provided with a demand controlled kitchen ventilation controls or something like that. That makes sense to me because the, the title is not code language. So we can't, we need to repeat it in some cases. Yeah, okay, we can we can find a place to put that in there. So Chris is marking it up in real time, which is great. And I think the general idea is when she marks stuff up and nobody has comments on it, then that is what we will start talking about next time we talk about this. So, um, so you don't need to do anything, Nick, except the bit of homework on the wordsmithing of the exception one. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how do you, how does everybody feel about the, um, the language as written? Demand control, kitchen ventilation, GCKB shall be provided where kitchen or kitchen. Is that, you, please use your, um, your reactions. Thumbs up, thumbs down, Lisa. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, what Eric said is correct. Um, that, yeah, what Chris is doing right now. <laughs> yep. Okay. It, it needs to talk about, they shall be provided with this technology. Uh, that's the correct way to state it. Yep, great. Okay, awesome. I think we are, are we done with yeah, this? Yeah, after ventilation add controls, I guess, right? Demand ventilation controls. Yep. There you go. Good. <laughs> All right. Lisa's Thanks. MacBook likes it. Okay. Um, means we are on to fan power allowance tables for 138. And that is it's a long one with Nick again. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so this one touches a lot of sections, um, which is why it's so long, but I kind of broke the proposal up into three three big sections. The, the first is we're just completely replacing the fan power uh, limitation and fan power pressure drop adjustment sections with this new section. So that's that's all just stricken. Um, and so what this is doing is aligning the way that both Title 24 and ASHRAE are <clears throat> now looking at uh, fan systems and fan power allowances by uh, system types rather than just by uh, motor horsepower or kind of assumptions based on a constant volume or a variable volume system. So this is language directly pulled from the case study, California, that was based on work that uh, John Bate is doing for ASHRAE uh, and moving it through that, that body right now. Uh, there are a couple of minor tweaks from California version to make it a little bit more applicable to Washington, um, a little bit cleaning up the language, but, but the, the basis is the same. So what we have is uh, instead of having just the horsepower and, and brake horsepower tables for fan power allowances based on supply or CFM, uh, you now have to calculate uh, your watts per CFM for each fan system and you're given a maximum uh, watts per CFM allowance in the tables uh, referenced down below. If you can scroll down, Krista, there's a couple tables. So these vary based on whether you have a multi-zone system or another fan system type. And they also vary based on the size of the system and all the uh, different components that your system may be uh, made up of. And so the idea here is that you, the way that this was developed was to look at actual cut sheet data for units that are out there on the market, what the pressure drops are for each section in those systems, how that varies based on uh, building size and CFM size and coming up with a uh, pressure allowance for each of those that's then converted into a <clears throat> maximum allowance watts per uh, CFM. So you've got that for supply fan. The second table is for all the other fans, exhaust return, relief, um, and you have a, an allowance here. And the, the language steps you through how to calculate this, but, but in essence, you just have a system that you build up based on these uh, uh, watts per CFM. And as long as your system doesn't exceed those, then you are uh, able to comply with this section. And so the, the big thing this does is it, it moves the threshold down. So previously the fan power allowances were five horsepower and above. Now it's for any fan system with a one KW or larger fan has to comply with this section. <clears throat> um, so it helps to uh, get a lot of the smaller fans in before. I think it's uh, acknowledged that the current code is pretty stringent on lar larger systems, but less stringent for these smaller fans. And this kind of brings that more in line with each other. Um, and also that the, the current assumptions for um, the fan power allowances are based on these static pressure assumptions for uh, VAV fan systems and for constant volume systems. But um, those can vary pretty widely based on how the system's built up. So this tries to uh, take it a little bit further and give you a component by component buildup. Uh, for each of these. All right, so this is a, a lengthy proposal. Um, what other, do you have any comments thus far? Any thumbs ups, negative reactions? Robbie yeah, this... has something. Mike Kennedy likes it. Go ahead, Robbie. What's the, what's the basis for this again? Maybe I tuned that out, but. Is this all homegrown or did this come out of any other body? Yeah, so it's uh, it's being adopted in California under the new 2022 Title 24. Uh, and that's based on work that this is, is being referenced from ASHRAE 90.1. So John Bade is the author of this, um, this work and he's pushing it through the 90.1 subcommittees right now, um, kind of in its final edits and it's made its way through, through Title 24's um, 45 day language. Yeah, I mean, I, the agenda I had, I guess I downloaded it a while ago, didn't have this, so I haven't had a chance to look at it, but I will say that this section needed an overhaul. So I'm hoping this is what it needed. Yeah, I believe the previous section, you know, a lot of the states referenced that same horsepower break horsepower table. That was, um, I think Mike Kennedy said something like 90.1, 2001. So it's, it's a decade old. 
um, the other two parts to this proposal, so that's kind of the main part of it. The, the other two parts are the um, alterations section. So that table right there. So if you are doing an alteration or replacement, you're given additional fan power allowances for that, but you would have to comply, um, you know, if you changed out mechanical equipment. That also appears in, in Title 24 uh, for this fan power allowance. And then just below this are sort of the related reference fixes because we reference this section throughout the code for a lot of uh, other sections. So this aligns language with that, with that section. So these energy recovery section and the high VAV, high efficiency VAV sections are just to make sure the language is consistent. So Nick, for the um, so is is this entire thing coming from the ninety point one, or is it just the first part of it? Uh, nope, the entire thing comes from ninety point one and okay. Title Twenty Four. Great. Okay. Any other questions, comments, thoughts? All right. Thanks, Nick. And I guess if ninety point one changes a little bit, we can probably look at updating this as well. Great. Within the tag process. Okay. Great. Okay. Next, we have DDC systems. This is a Mike McGivern proposal. Mike, are you? There you are. Yes, I am. I uh, brought this up uh, when we were reviewing the integrated draft and uh, there's a new section uh, C403.2.3 that was added to the IECC to provide a minimum fault diagnosis under the model code. This code change proposals to collate the new requirement for fault detection with DDC system requirements under section C403.4 HVAC system controls. This would make the document more usable and accept the fault detection requirements for buildings that are required to have DDC systems with fault diagnosis and detection available as control points in the programming of the DDC. Chris. So yeah, my, my only question would be, is, is, is stuff ready for this? I know we looked into this as a utility to run programs, and I think we now are running a few programs that involve this kind of um, work uh, or a monitoring of HVAC systems. And I, I just felt like it was pretty early on and there weren't a lot of people out there doing it or customers knowing about it um, when I was working on this a couple of years ago. Can anybody speak to the state of the market on this? Um, this code won't go into effect until July 1, 2023. So there's there's time and, and sometimes the code brings product to market um, because people see it in advance and then they, they respond to it. Can anybody speak to Chris's kind of question? Rob? This was added to, to the IECC and, uh, you know, it's really not a change. It's just at relocating it uh, to uh, align with DDC as under the HVAC control section of the code. It's just trying to clean up the, the code uh, sections a bit uh, to make it more user friendly and then add the uh, because the IECC does not require DDC control systems, uh, it's just adding uh, the exception so that it can be omitted since it's already implied to be represented in the DDC system. Rob? I was just gonna mention that uh, we've been, at least in Snohomish County, have not seen a lot of adoption of any of this technology, especially in the 
medium office, medium uh, retail. Um, little what systems were installed usually are looked at for the first uh, couple months and then kicked to the curb, unfortunately. But it goes against my background of operating buildings. But um, yeah, it's not quite there yet. Hey, thanks, Rob. Mike? Kennedy? Yeah, I wanted to, I guess, uh, reiterate what was just said that this is already in code. I mean, it's not just in the IECC. This section is in the integrated draft as 403.2.3. So is this just renumbering? Uh, it's just oh, okay. renumbering uh, to 412. Okay. And I, I can't speak to whether that's a good move. I would, whether it's mandatory or not might be an issue and whether it belongs there, I don't know, but this is an existing section in code. Okay, I guess I had somehow failed to notice that. So if this is already existing in code, then the question on the table right now is, do we move it or not? Not do we include it in the code? Um, unless there was a code proposal later to strike it from the code. David. I think it's both moving and adding an additional exception, I believe, for the DDC system. And I guess I would argue that DDC shouldn't be excluded because not all DDCs include, I think, all of these items necessarily. And I think it just gives emphasis that the DDC contractor should be incorporating this criteria in their system design. Let's take a just um, use your reactions and tell me whether you think. And the question on the table is moving this or not. Um, whether you think moving this is, is, a, is a good idea for clarity. And you can use your, your X, your red X, if you don't like the idea or your, any of the other ones will basically, except for the crying one, will say that you like this idea of moving it. We've all fallen asleep after our Okay, a few people like the idea of moving it. Um, I don't know, unless we have a code proposal to actually strike this section that we can do so. Krista, do you have any advice on that? I think the council could do it as a new, or the committee could recommend it as part of the new change, but I'm not sure at this point that the tag could do that. Okay. Okay. So if if you were if you don't think this is ready for prime time and don't think this this should be part of the code, <clears throat> the tag is not the right area to bring it up in. The MV committee will consider this probably in August or so, and when that committee does so, please bring up that you don't like this and the MVE committee could do something at that point. Okay, so let's move forward. I think this one has no comments on whether it's a good change or not. The comments are about the underlying language and requirement, which this body cannot change. <clears throat> All right. Hot water coil capacity. <clears throat> and this is a Mark Frankel. Yes, it is. Mark Frankel on behalf of Morgan Heater. So there's two, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, so there's two uh, hot water coil proposals, one after another, and they're related and Rob, Robbie, submitted the other and we've been sort of doing some back and forth to sort of understand the intent and, and the relationship and we have a little more work to do on that. But I will try and characterize them so that you understand the difference and Robbie can weigh in. What we're trying to do in this proposal is, is require the design of hot water heating coils such that in the future, they could be converted to run on heat pumps, even if they're gas now, without having to change out piping and coils to get to a heat pump. So, so make it heat pump ready. 
And what Robbie's proposal is doing is trying to optimize coil size to reduce pumping energy. And again, Robbie, you, you're going to have to weigh in on if I'm mischaracterizing. And they aren't necessarily mutually exclusive, but currently they are conflicting. And so they need to be resolved. Um, the, what Robbie is, is achieving is reducing pump energy with smaller pipes and more efficient coils. But the, then that relies on higher temperature delivery than we can get out of heat pump systems. So right now they, they definitely conflict, but I think there's a pathway to, to align them such that, especially on the heating side, we design the coils for potential heat pump use and, and still capture some of the efficiency Robbie's looking for. But we got a little work to do on that. Thanks, Mark. Robbie. Robbie, you're on mute. There we go. Um, yeah, so thanks, Mark. I would say my proposal uh, was really just taking some good language I thought that ASHRAE 90.1 had on chilled water coil selections and um, extending that uh, to hot water coils as well, because the basically the chilled water coil language there is straight out of 90.1. The hot water coil is a mirror that I tried to create um, from that language. Um, I think that the language in uh, Mark's proposal here is a little too restrictive, and uh, but I, I think the intent is good. So I, I'd sort of like to wrap the two together and we can work offline to basically accomplish what, what Mark and Morgan are looking for in terms of um, making it so heating coil replacements today or new heating coils today don't preclude the use of heat pumps tomorrow. Um, and so I think you know, we can kind of take the set points and the design points that are in this proposal and fold them into my proposal while, you know, keeping some of these exceptions here so that we, you know, make sure we don't put in something that's too onerous for an existing building, for instance, you know, a small, small retrofit with a big system, you don't want to force them into doing some sort of system level replacement at that point. So speaking as an, as an architect that is just looking at numbers here, is the difference, the big difference for the hot water the 115 versus 118 and the 10 versus 15 degree temperature difference. Are those the two big differences? Yes. And it's a matter of what the maximum delivery temperature you can get out of a heat pump and how big the coil needs to be to take advantage of a lower delivery temperature. So <clears throat> that's the difference. Yeah. And I would say that the, uh, I'm certainly flexible on the temperature, the first temperature number. Um, I think that getting it low, enough to where heat pumps can handle that uh, with an appropriate lift uh, is good. I think that 10 degree delta T number needs to have some, some flexibility to it because from what I'm understanding from Mark and Morgan, that's sort of based on a specific heat pump technology that uses R410A, whereas there are different heat pumps that can handle a higher delta T and we don't wanna restrict those heat pumps from taking advantage of pump energy savings. Yeah. Yeah, and so I think there's a path to it to an alignment. Okay, uh, Gary. Thanks, Jill. Um, unfortunately, this proposal um, will actually increase energy and not and not save any energy uh, by designing the coil for the lower temperatures. You increase the size of the coil. You increase the number of rows. You're increasing the air pressure drop. You're increasing the water pressure drop. Uh, which is uh, going to increase both fan and pumping energy. And, and so um, this proposal, un unfortunately, just adds cost and, and size and actually uh, increases energy usage and, and does nothing to save any energy. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth? Yeah, Elizabeth Joyce, Mechanical. Um, so... Um, I wanted to say that I, um, you know, support definitely the impetus behind um, this proposal. I'd love to be a part of um, any of those side conversations because this is something that we've looked into a good bit. And some of those temperatures do look a little bit um, aggressive, um, but I recognize that it kind of depends on the technology that you're, you're using. Um, I like that the proposal on the right, which I think was mentioned kind of came out of ASHRAE, um, addresses stuff like, you know, airside pressure drop um, and would support something that can kind of fold in that sort of language that recognizes um, uh, the retrofit situation. Um, so 
yeah, wanted to just put that out there. Thanks, Elizabeth. Chris? Chris, you're on mute. Sorry, my Pomeranian decided to start barking right when I was about to talk. Uh, I guess one one question I just had is, are there, does this conflict with uh, places that use hot water for some type of process that needs to be above 118 degrees? And then make sure when we're thinking through this that we're thinking through any exemptions that need to be made based on, based on any, any other temperature needs uh, beyond this. Mark or Robbie? Uh, yeah, I think that's where my proposal is a little more flexible, like that exception five, we could play with that 90 degree number, but basically if you figure out at what's the highest reasonable air temperature you could deliver with a coil design to this point, then you need an exception for where you have to supply temperatures that are higher than that, right? So like if you had a, I don't know, like a, a burn ward in a hospital, I think they, they need to keep warmer temperatures in there. So um, yeah, there's we should have an exception that lets you do different coils for processes. And can I go? Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, so, and I'm not sure if that question was about like process loads in general or, or space heating for special uh, special use case, which I think Robbie addressed. And, and I agree that, you know, I think some of these exceptions will help us address that. With respect to the comment about the efficiency of the coil, um, you know, obviously you still have good coil design, but the opportunity for savings, you know, the, the cost of some additional pumping energy in the short term allows, a, you know, a factor of three improvement in system performance if we get to a COP of three with a heat pump or what have you. So, you know, we, we have a potential significant gain that's precluded if we don't adopt coils that can handle heat pumps in the future. Thanks, Mark. Um, Yes, I remember when I talked about heat pumps and water, I, I hear about um, Legionella. Um, and I think you need to get up to 140 to get rid of that. Is that, I'm an architect though, so I could be saying something extremely dumb. Well, these are these are for heating coils for space uh, heating use. So okay. this would be with a different system. If you had a heating water system that you were trying to make domestic hot water with, at 140, then yeah, you would have to deliver warmer water, but that's sort of like a process, like we we're saying. Okay, so the, these these systems are now subject to regional. Yeah, the, what we're talking about here is a, a coil that interfaces in an airstream and heats up air for space heating. Oh, okay. okay. Did that get at your question, Cal? Cal? Yes. Yes, if yes. The water's not open to, to the air with where it can get into your lungs, then that's not an issue. It has to do with cooling towers and domestic hot water systems, the Legionella issue. Okay, that, that's good to know. Um, are there any other thoughts? It sounds like a after Mike talks, my thought, well, before Mike talks, I, my thought was Mark, Robbie, and um, uh, Elizabeth could get together and think through this a bit more, um, unless we have a direction we want to provide today. Mike Kennedy. Uh, I was just wondering why you picked uh, 5,000 CFM to exempt the individual fan coil. I, that's mirrored from the chilled water language above from 90.1. I'm not, I'm not particularly attached to any of these. I those exceptions for the most part, I'm just mirroring. So I didn't run any big calculations or anything. Because doesn't that eliminate an awful lot of cooling coils or heating coils? Yeah, I mean, it, it really just targets air handlers. So I'm sure that that's something that, uh, that Mark and Morgan would wanna talk about in terms of limiting that. They're probably wanting this to apply to most uh, terminal heating devices. So that 5,000 CF number, CFM number will probably go away. Okay. Okay, so is the idea that, that do, we, do we have any more direction we can provide to this um, hoped for working group with Mark, David, and Elizabeth? 
Okay, I'm gonna- Elizabeth, do I have your contact info or do you have a way to get in touch with me? Um, I think I, I have the, your email address, okay. so yeah. Great, reach out and we'll get all connected. Sounds great. Okay, um, let's move on to um, 164. Which is a Dwayne proposal. I guess we, Dwayne has probably not landed yet and rejoined this call. So let's move on to package heat tip, which is a Mike Kennedy. Yeah, a small thing compared to some of the ones we've just talked about. Um, in code currently, we require uh, package electric heating and cooling equipment to, uh, if it has heat, to uh, have a, be a heat pump. Um, and then in another part of code, we, have, we control the, we have a section on controls of the supplementary heat and limiting the electric resistance under a lo load of conditions, basically. So it just operates when the heat pump can't. Um, and package terminal heat pumps um, have integral controls that don't qualify with that. So we put in this exception um, that package terminal heat pumps um, only had to have the outdoor air lockout temperature. Um, so the problem here is that they don't, aren't capable of that either. Um, and in fact, a lot of heat pumps don't have, I mean, they don't have defrost and they don't operate the compressor below 40 degrees. Um, so this was an attempt to make, um, make a path so that package terminal heat pumps could legally get through code. Um, I certainly have been led to believe they're going through code anyway, but, um, and just require that they have defrost and that the unit actually be able to operate in heat pump mode down to 25. There are several major manufacturers that qualify for that. There are a load that don't. Um, I, I thought about getting more aggressive and, and requiring um, like an inverter. Um, there are now some of these units and not major brands, but that are starting to run on the same technologies that are endless heat pumps um, that would be much more capable and deliver much more heating as a heat pump rather than resistance. Um, but uh, this was meant to be just kind of a clarification of a, allowing a legal path for some, some of the better, but not great package terminal units. Any comments, any thoughts? Are we, are we sure that there's enough uh, stuff out there, enough equipment out there on the market to be able to satisfy this? Uh, GE Zone Line, uh, Fredrickson makes a unit. Yeah, there's some pretty big makers. Okay. Cool. Um, the, the issue is there's a lot of equipment, you know, these are national, man, you know, there's a lot of equipment that's designed for the Southeast where having defrost is just not something that's, um, that they even think of really. So um, it's just eliminating that equipment. Um, there are, I mean, and I don't know, you know, our code, this is two years out, right, for this code. Um, there are units coming along that are really f just like ductless heat pumps. They're great units. Um, so it, it seems good to have a legal path through code um, for them. And I think if we make it a little tough now, maybe some better units will come along. So Mike, can you say what you mean when you say legal? Well, currently there is not a package terminal heat pump that can accept a 40 degree, uh, an external control that locks out the resistance at 40 degrees. There are none. There's one unit that has an integrated thing at 46. Um, and then in these, these units that are kind of these specialty items that are much, much more expensive, you can actually install them without resistance. But none of the units going in for the most part are comply with this language. 
but I guess making something legal, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm missing something really basic here, but what would make something that locks out at 40 degrees illegal or not legal? That's what our code currently requires. Oh, okay. So right now it doesn't really allow. And, and, and I'm fine with that if it was really being enforced. Oh, okay. I, they're, they're really not very, they're really electric resistance heaters. Okay. Just heating your room. Um, I shouldn't say that. But anyway, this ensures that you're going to get something that's at least capable of running down to freezing and below. Okay, that makes sense. I, I understand uh, where you're coming from now. Lisa. Uh, yeah, thank you. And, and thanks, Mike, for putting this together. It, it, it is addressing an issue um, that we hear about on a pretty regular basis um, in that there is still a lot of this equipment, the, the PTHPs in particular, so a lot of this equipment's going in, you know, where you're seeing it in, in, in new construction for hotels and, and assisted living facilities. And this detail uh, that, you know, preventing the supplemental heater to operating above 40 degrees, that's just a detail that's not being in, enforced uh, you know, maybe there's a couple jurisdictions that, you know, they have the expertise in house to, they're going to dive into that level of detail. But the problem is, is that there's a lot of this equipment being installed in the state that it's, is to Mike's point, technically not code compliant. So if we can do, you know, add some uh, additional requirements as Mike is proposing that would, uh, require this equipment to be you know, perform better and actually push the industry perhaps into uh, higher efficient technology, that would be a, a real plus. Great, thanks. Um, Nick? Yeah, just, just wanna voice support for this as well. We did a lot of work on PTHPs for utility programs. And if you look at the reports that have come out on the measurement verification of these, a lot of the kind of market baseline units will drop into electric resistance mode at 40 and stay there until the outside air temperature gets well above 40 degrees. And some of them don't even switch back over. So I think having something that tries to, you know, um, dissect the market a little bit and, and get the better performing heat pumps out there uh, that are able to do this is, is a wise move. Because as Lisa said, there are a lot of these going in. There's a lot of utility programs that are incentivizing, P, incentivizing PTHPs. Um, so this would be great to to separate the wheat from the chef. Teresa. Hi, I'm, can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Uh, again, voicing support actually. Uh, coming from the commissioning standpoint, uh, building developers are adding air conditioning load to apartment buildings. And they are often choosing this technology as a low cost option to add air conditioning where there used to only be uh, electric resistance heat. Um, so I would love to see the heat pumps actually working in those in those uh, markets. Awesome, Lisa. All right. It sounds like we have lots of support for this, um, and nobody suggested that we change any language. So great job. Let's move on to boiler controls. Here's a Mike Kennedy proposal. I think, I think oh, it's Nick and mine. But okay, sorry. I have Mike is back up in case uh, I guess it wasn't there. Yeah, so this is a new section uh, that's not currently in the Washington State Energy Code. Uh, and this would add um, <clears throat> boiler system controls for both commercial and process boilers over. Um, uh, two and a half million BTU threshold for uh, um, combustion air controls and then um, uh, require fan motors uh, with VFDs um, and, uh, and limit the, the total design wattage um, when it's at half speed. So um, this has actually been in Title, Title 24 for over a decade. Um, they just recently updated the um, gas stack oxygen concentration limits on process boilers to 3%, where it was previously 5%. Uh, but this has been um, 
widely adopted down there for mm -hmm. over, over a decade and it seems like it's about time to add it to Washington. Um, this does not impact smaller boiler systems where adding something like a oxygen, oxygen concentration control could be a little cost prohibitive. This is only on the larger boilers. Uh, it's incredibly cost effective, especially for process boilers that are, you know, running uh, many hours a year. Um, so this would be a new section. It would align with Title 24 requirements that are going into their 2022 code. Um, and the only difference here is tightening some of the uh, verbose language in there to make a, a table instead of repeating the whole section for process and combustion, so that, or I'm sorry, process and commercial. Um, so this kind of um, more succinctly says the same thing. And then it just moves the boiler turndown section um, down below to the a subsection of 403.3.4.2, uh, um, where it was just the only section that dealt with uh, boiler controls previously. Thanks, Nick. Um, one question. So when it says all newly installed boiler systems, does that in, in code language say that a replacement system doesn't need to do that? Or does it say that a replacement system does need to do that? Hmm. Yeah, I, uh, I would say this would be only applied for new construction, not for replacements. Um, but I could look at see the applicability of that for replacements as well. But um, I think the intent here was for new boilers going in. in new buildings. In new buildings. And I guess right. I, I'm not as familiar with interpreting code language to know if the word newly installed refers to only new construction or refers to replacement of systems. Robbie. I like the normal way that we handle that if you want it to just apply to new construction is you actually have an exception in the chapter five. Like, I, I don't think that newly installed portion is covering it. You'd have to say boiler systems in new buildings or something. Um, but typically, I think you would just write this as if it applies to everything and then the existing building section would, uh, would cover that with an exception. Yeah. And actually, now that I'm rereading it, um, it's a boiler system, not a boiler itself. So it would only apply when you're replacing the entire system, I guess. Mm -hmm. Which, which, in which case, it maybe we 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 would want that. So, are you suggesting just the language can stay as is, um, but have an exception that says not applicable for something, you know? Well, I guess what I'm additions and alterations. I guess what I'm seeing on rereading it and, and thinking through it a bit more was is it says all newly installed boiler systems. So I guess if you're replacing an entire building's boiler system, I'm assuming it, it's more than a boiler, it's boiler and, and some other stuff. But if you're replacing the entire system, then we would actually want this to apply. So maybe no change. Right. Yeah. The the boiler system is a defined term and it's it's the boilers and piping controls, all that stuff. Yeah. So I don't know what your opinion is, but it seems like if you're placing the whole system, you would you would want to do mm -hmm. all the good things in here. Right, yeah. I, I, okay. Yeah. Mike Kennedy? If we adopt this, we should add this section to the process language in my proposal. In other words, this is covering process boilers. Um, so, um, that should be um, a section that's linked in the application language and also in this first exception in C403. Hearing no objections to that, Krista, do you know how to take care of what he said? Yep, I got it. Awesome. Okay, I, I don't see any more comments on this or hands raised. So given that, shall we move on? High capacity space heating boilers. Okay. Um, this is new. 90.1 language. Uh, so there's two changes here. One is 
currently we have a boiler turn down section that's 403.3.4. Um, so I could minimize the renumbering. I made kind of a general section of boiler requirements and took the existing boiler turn down language and made it the first subsection. And then the real insertion here is the language after the table. Um, and that's the new new code language. Um, and this is based on a 90.1 uh, published addendum. So it'll be it'll be published in uh, officially the next version of 90.1. It actually was in the very first printing of the 19, 20, 2019 90.1, but then it got excised um, because it had passed officially, well, I guess one day late to be included in the published version. Um, so anyway, this is language that's been approved and will be part of ASHRAE. Um, uh, it is basically identical language and ASHRAE is um, uh, a national, we, we, if we copy ASHRAE language, we don't have to worry about preemption which since we're dealing with boiler efficiency here is an issue. This, this proposal would require essentially high capacity space heating, hot water boilers, um, and actually boiler systems between one and 10 million BTUs to be condensing or average 90%. Um, there's also some requirements for hot water distribution system design, um, which probably uh, it may not be needed depending on what happens with the uh, Robbie Mark Frankel discussion on coils, um, but that needs to be considered in the language, what happens there. So okay. but basically it's requiring condensing, condensing boilers and then um, requiring some coil sizing that can utilize those boilers. Okay. Are there any thoughts, any comments, suggestions? Okay. There is a typo where the exception four is repeats the four. Um, and then, yeah, we'll have to revisit the um, distribution system, depending on what's done with the coil language. Yep, sounds good. So the next one is a Dwayne one. So we're going to skip that. We already covered 97, so we're gonna to go to part load controls. Number 54, which is Robbie. <clears throat> yeah, so the, the intent of this one is, you know, the, the code would require us to reset our supply water temperature difference. Um, but systems with large thermal energy storage uh, rely on that temperature difference at the design to maintain the capacity of the thermal energy storage. So my intent here was to, um, provide an exception for what is a relatively uncommon system at this point, um, but may become more common as we're doing uh, more and more heat pumps to help with the load shedding. That makes a lot of sense. We're, we're seeing more projects consider thermal storage. Does anybody have comments on this? Mike Kennedy. Well, just it just because I think it's an issue that we might need to address. This would actually increase energy use, right? In the saving, it would save peak energy use, um, and it seems like we're going to probably be starting to look at a lot of things that do that kind of thing. Um, so I, I just thought at some point we need to discuss that. Uh, it's not necessarily as straightforward as that, but yeah, I mean, it's a trade-off. I think thermal energy storage can enable some strategies that you can't otherwise do. And so that's what I mean by it's, you know, it's kind of a trade-off. 
like you can use thermal energy storage to maximize uh, simultaneous heating and cooling that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do. Um, and uh, But in order to, to really gain the most benefit from your thermal energy storage, you need to keep that delta T at design. And certain thermal energy storage tanks are use, uh, use stratified water as a, as a principle. And so that, that delta T being um, maintained is good to avoid blending. Okay. David, ready? Um, I mean, is there a threshold or for what would be considered thermal energy storage? I don't think we have a definition or, or a criteria for when somebody could demonstrate they have a thermal energy storage system, right? It could be a loophole, potentially. I mean, I, I think that is possibly true, David, but I also don't see people, like if you don't want to do this, you just don't do it. No one's true. No one's really enforcing these it's these code sections. Mm -hmm. Nobody's enforcing them. I I've never gotten a comment on my sequence of operations, Chell. So, All right, and you can just change it after the building systems operational, anyway. So, I mean, I, I've designed thermal energy storage systems that do not follow this code provision. So, I'm basically just trying to make myself uh, comply. Mm -hmm. have a valid okay. path of compliance. <laughs> I appreciate the honesty. Mark Frankel. Yeah, I mean, it was said that thermal energy systems don't save energy, but we also have a carbon metric and a cost metric, either of which could be saved with a thermal energy system over the baseline. So depending on the data available. Yeah, certainly if you took 8760, Carbon thermal energy would would save save on carbon. Well, and there's time of use rates being piloted in various utilities around the state that would introduce a you know a cost savings depending on having storage. So, okay, okay. So does does do we feel we need to define thermal energy storage or provide a, a minimum on there? Um, should we send the proponent some homework, or do we think it's we're early enough in this that, that we can just leave it at providing thermal energy storage. Or since nobody's enforcing this, perhaps it doesn't matter. Perhaps I mean, it, it might not be bad to, to have a definition for thermal energy storage. So I can, I can take that as homework and maybe that would be a meaningful use of this proposal other than just making me feel good. Yeah, I think I think that would be good. And then, you know, other jurisdictions tend to adopt things that we adopt. So if this becomes part of the code, then other people will say, oh, look at them. They did that. Um, so either a, what what is a minimal amount of thermal energy storage or what is something that would, you know, make this a little bit more more real, I guess. Okay. Sounds good. DDC controls is the next one. And who gets to claim this one as their Eric? Eric Landerman. You were on here earlier. I remember you. Okay. Yeah. Go on to the next one then. Another green one. Hey, who's this one? Who gets to claim this one? This is Lisa's. Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Let's 
Sorry, let me take a look at this one. This is PTHB condomizer exception. Ah, yes, thank you. I didn't recognize the uh, title there. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so uh, this is in kind of following with the, what we were talking about earlier about PTHPs. Um, the description in this proposal talks a lot about what we were saying before, which is that you know, we are seeing um, uh, to, uh, hotel motels and um, group R1, or I'm sorry, group um, I1. And so inherently this equipment, it, it does not, it's not capable of having economizer, uh, you know, they're, they're just, that's not the way this equipment is designed. So it's not possible for them to comply with the economizer requirement standalone. And so uh, what this proposal does is it provides a path for that equipment uh, for specifically R1 and group I1 occupancies if they meet the balanced ventilation requirements that is currently only required for group R2. Comments, concerns, questions? David. Um, there is another proposal related to Economizers, I believe that Eric Bannerme submitted um, that maybe needs to be coordinated with this one. I haven't read them both in detail to know how how they overlap or if they do. Have you looked at that, Lisa? Uh, no, I did not. Uh, which number is that one? It's um, it's, there's three in a row on the agenda list, 184, 185, and 228, which... Oh, it's 228. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. I know I did not look at that yet. I, I will take a look at that one here shortly. Okay. Joe, do you want us to... to go through all three proposals and then just figure out how they need to be correlated? How do you want to do that? Yeah. Um, did you say three proposals or two? Uh, well, uh, ETC submitted two and then, uh, so the 80, 184, 185, okay. yep. and then 228 is, is a similar proposal. Okay. Um, well, given that Eric is not here to defend his proposal, I would suggest that um, you present your two proposals mm -hmm. and then coordinate offline with Eric on if they're exactly the same or not. And if not, is there a preferred route based on the comments that the tag makes to you today? Does that seem like a good, good way to go? Sure. Yeah. And after just quick scan here, and again, I apologize. I didn't, I didn't uh, get to this one. Um, I, I'm not seeing an overlap, uh, but I'll, I'll look at it more thoroughly after the meeting. Okay. And yeah. we have two people raising their hands. Uh, go ahead, David. Oh, I, could I participate with that? Well, if, either way, I know I've been working through this first exception on with an trying to interpret it and apply it um, and gotten varying interpretations from even the, the person who proposed the original exception one for the 2018 code. So it'd be, if it's possible to work with you on this, uh, this proposal would be great. Sure, sure. Okay, David. Hi, Kenny. So currently, Lisa, what the group, well, R1 and R2, they can install without an economizer if they're what, 15% better efficiency? Yes, so this would be an, an alternative to that in the sense that, um, you know, and, and, and I think the, the group addressed this, is, that is that 
there's hardly any equipment out there that is 15% better than code. Now, hopefully the industry will move in that direction, uh, but right now, not very many types of equipment can actually meet that, or products can meet that. Right. So Eric just joined us, so I want to um, give, Eric, are you listening now? Yeah, I'm here. Awesome. We just, got, we just got to 184, 185, and your proposal, 228, and so we're going to kind of go through them. So okay. that's where we are. Great. So Mike, go ahead. Oh, no, I'm, I'm done. Okay. Lisa. Like, yeah, let, why don't I go through 185 and then we can um, go through Eric's as well. And uh, this one, <clears throat> we're, we see this is closing a little bit a little bit of a, a loophole. I don't know how many projects actually are trying to put PTHPs into group R2. Uh, I don't know how common that is, um, but there is an exception already that if somebody does want to put in uh, PTHPs into, and that's what this is targeting, uh, if they want to put in that type of equipment in um, group R2, then there is the exception that Mike was just talking about that requires the equipment to be 15% better than code. So it's like, if you wanna put that equipment in there, it has to be better, you know, higher efficiency. And so what this does is it, it eliminates the ability to just say, hey, we're just putting in a DOAS and, and we're good. We don't need to, uh, we can put in whatever type of heating and cooling equipment we want in that group R2. There are other requirements in the code that's kind of pushing group R2 to be higher efficient equipment. So we're, we're trying to close that, that gap with this proposal. When everybody raises their hand at once. All right. Do we want to discuss or do you want to move on to the next one and, and, and correlate back? So, Lisa, Eric. Uh, Eric, Lisa hadn't read your proposal before this. And so I don't know if attempting to figure out any commonalities live is, is a good use of time or if um, it should be an offline discussion. Yeah, my, my proposal was just there to try to clarify that, you know, PTHPs or VTHPs or mini splits. Um, you know, we, we don't want to outlaw the, the high efficiency um, mini split technology or maybe the standard efficiency, you know, heat pump heating technology as we are, you know, a heating driven climate in a lot of these areas. And uh, so I was just trying to provide it, uh, gotten feedback that, you know, that this, this code language that we've had for a long time um, is vague as to what what it means if if the condensing unit is installed outside. Does that mean that uh, on a split unit? Does that mean that I can't um, use these exceptions? Um, so that I mean that's why we're trying to clarify exception five. Um, you know that we are seeing a lot of new technology coming with the uh, the dual duct um, PTH. P for, for residential, um, which, you know, has a high efficiency inverter driven compressor. And uh, 
so those units can off, obviously get to the, some of these higher efficiencies and use exception five, um, but kind of the standard VTHPs and PTHPs, you know, can't get to these efficiencies and therefore under the 20, you know, the 2018 code, they're able to use exception one. Um, so, I, so yeah, I guess it's an interesting proposal to, to remove that from group R um, and just force them to, to go to a, a higher efficiency equipment using exception five, so. Okay, Mike Kennedy. Um, I wondered about having the word with before supply fans, cooling systems with supply fans. Um, I was getting my head wrapped around supply fans having an economizer. Well, I think. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to yeah, designate where the supply fan is, is the location. The supply fan is located outside or is located in a mechanical room. Um, right, but you're requiring the cooling system to have the economizer, right? Or exempting the cooling system from having the economizer. That's right, so a rooftop package unit wouldn't be exempt because your supply fan is outside. Um, That's why I thought the language might be clear with cooling systems with supply fans, but. So that's uh, this one? But, yeah. but like an indoor split system, like it still has an, a supply fan, right? But with installed outside? No, it doesn't, right. So. Yeah, that's, I guess I was seeing the clause would be with supply fans not installed outdoors or with supply fans installed outdoors. Yeah, I think with can work, yeah. I don't know. So yeah, I have another word choice perhaps. How about cooling systems? where the supply fans um where where something like that where the supply fan um are not is, installed is not installed outdoors yeah something like that cooling systems uh, it, i guess do do supply fan and is maybe better because we're talking it on a system by system level. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, cooling, cooling system where the supply fan is installed, um, is not installed outdoors. That, that, that's a, a good change, Eric. I, 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 I support that. Do you have any comments um, for our proposed change to exception one? Uh, it's just making the code more stringent, yeah. Okay. And it, it will it will force it will force group R to um, to exception five, and that will take them away from you know a standard efficiency PTHP or a standard efficiency VTHP. But um, you know we're still we're seeing a a really big cost increase. Uh, we had a multifamily project. That was, I don't know, four or five hundred units, and the the cost add to go from a, you know a, the VTHP. If you're familiar with those, it's it's a a vertical terminal heat pump that is able to be ducted to multiple rooms, but it's installed on the perimeter wall through a and condenser air comes through a, a louver band. Um, to go, to, it was like a, you know, a five hundred thousand dollar ad, I think, to go to the inverter driven compressor on that project, and I think uh, PSE was willing to give us a thirty thousand dollar rebate, um, you know, something like that. It was just grossly out of proportion from a cost standpoint, but um, so the project, you know, under, that was a twenty fifteen code project. So we ended up doing energy modeling to. Uh, you know, to get out of the airside and economizer requirement. So 
it, it's the, the cost for the inverter driven equipment is rather high to get to that 15% better on, on these small these small PTHP and VTHP systems. I'm gonna add that the multifamily is one of the laggards in terms of meeting the 70% energy reduction at the state level. So whether it's this or other things, multifamily needs to get much more efficient in this cycle um, in some way, just as a general statement. <clears throat> And, and Eric, just as a, a point of education uh, reference, so you're seeing PTHPs going into, sounds like going into large multifamily projects? With the new, uh, you know, Italian units that are now, the, the units coming from Italy, um, the Epoca units um, that, that have a wall port, one for a condenser air in, one for a condenser air out. So it's kind of just a small, you know, circle on your exterior facade and it's got an inverter to decompressor. Yeah, that, that is a new product that's now coming to the market that, uh, that projects are definitely actively looking at, so. And, and what, is, what is their level of efficiency? Can they meet that 15% better than code? Yeah. Great, okay. Mike Kennedy. Yeah. Um, uh, there's also Ice Air, Eric. So I believe a domestic maker, and they're using the guts of a Mitsubishi ductless heat pump in their units. Um, but I now, Lisa, you're also adding an exception, which doesn't makes it so R two doesn't have to, if they comply with the code related to the balanced ventilation, they don't need to do, they don't need to be 15% better. No, it's not, doesn't cover group R2. This is only group R1 and group I1. Um, so oh. hotel, motel and assisted living facilities, which are not required to have balanced ventilation. So that's what this exception um, does is it points to that balanced ventilation provision that right now is only required for group R2 sure. and allows, it, it says if you meet that for group R1 or group I1, then you don't have to have a colonizer. So for group R, you have to be 15% better, but for group I, you don't? Yeah, group I is not listed in exception five. Right. I guess I'm wondering why why we would let make group R be 15% better, but not the other ones. Yeah, that would be a different proposal. All right, just to wrap this up, because we have about two minutes left and I want to be respectful of people's six hours they've already dedicated to this meeting. Um, it, are we, are we generally moving forward with these proposals? Eric, Lisa, are you gonna revise them based on any comments today? Uh, I did not hear any comments that would change the language in, our, in my two proposals, no. So but I, I, you know, if anybody has any feedback, uh, you know, feel free to, to reach out to myself and, and, and Dwayne Llewellyn. So I guess one quick comment in regards to the I1 condition too. I mean, at the, the scoping of the code in 101 too, it says references to group R shall include I1 condition two. Oh, okay. So that's section C101.2. So. Hey. David Reddy, do you have a really quick comment? Well, just, I think I agree with Mike that, or uh, I, I don't know if this is what he was saying, but that, um, it doesn't seem like we should exclude those um, either hotel or the group I one from the requirement of being 15% better. Okay, we have one minute left. Um, thanks everybody, Eric and Lisa, do you need to get together and revise anything based on correlation between the two or are they mutual? Or are they not have any anything in common? 
Well, I like the editorial corrections or the editorial clarifications <clears throat> that we did today. So yeah, I'm in agreement with that. So. Okay. And I don't. All right, with that, thanks everybody. Um, we will publish a list of the future meetings and what we'll cover at those meetings. We got through almost everything today that we were hoping to. Um, so great job making quick comments and, and all that. Um, and there's more to come. See you in two weeks, if not before. Joe, what's the turnaround time for edits? I think 30 days, um, but we may want to consider your proposal much sooner than that. So. Uh, we won't consider them at least the building code council will consider them in a week, whether they want to refer them to the tag or not. Um, but the tag won't reconsider them for at least two weeks. We can talk offline about that, but that's generally the, the time frame. Thanks. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much for being part of this and contributing your comments. Thank you.